choices shape the market, our society, and our quality of life. That's why Euroconsumers helps millions of people in their daily choices, providing simple solutions to complex problems. Euroconsumers is a cluster of organizations, a network of people, a group established to protect consumer rights and well-being that brings consumers and companies together in transparent relationships of trust that respect their independence. Our deep understanding of products and consumption gives consumers a credible expert voice worldwide. We bridge the gap between buyers and manufacturers, between supply and demand. And in this digital age, we create opportunities for all parties to come together in constructive dialogue, partnering to build a future of better products and services. Euroconsumers has the power of a global group that believes humanity can develop, grow, and change for the better. And that we can promote this by uniting millions of consumers in strength and speaking responsibly for them while simultaneously engaging in relationships of trust with responsible, sustainable companies. Good afternoon from the studio of Test Asha in Brussels. A very, very warm welcome to you all and to this dazzling fourth edition of the Bext Euroconsumers Brands Awards. Now, as you all know, I think you all know, these brilliant awards recognize excellence in consumer brands. And I think you wouldn't be watching if you also didn't know that Euroconsumers brings together five national consumer organizations, Belgium, well, we're here in Italy, Portugal, Spain, and Brazil, and so thus harnesses the voices of around 1.5 million people. My name is Katrina Sickle. I have the pleasure and the privilege of navigating us all through this just under three hour event. Now, as you may imagine, not all of that time is dedicated to an award ceremony because that would make an extremely long one, I guess, Oscar length. No, Euroconsumers also likes to add every single time a little bit of dazzle, a little bit more sparkle and put some meat on the bones of all of those award categories. And we've got three thematic discussions for you today which really do tackle some of those issues that are of particular interest to but also concern for consumers today. We're going to have a deep dive into collective purchases. We're also going to look at energy and energy efficiency and more. And of course, we cannot have these awards and these discussions without looking at inflation and rising supermarket prices. More on those in a bit, because look, as if by magic, I'm joined by two speakers, two co-presenters, if you like. I have with me here, Raquel Colombo. She is market lead at Italian consumer organization, Altro Consumo. And I also have on my left, Michele Cavuoti, who is product manager at Euroconsumer. Consumers, a pleasure because actually you and I were together last year, which was uh, yeah. delightful, and we were doing the awards together. So lovely to see you again. Yeah. So a very warm welcome. Now, we're going to have a few moments to chat with both of them in just a minute, but what I'd like to do is just remind you, our audience, of the three categories and the eight sub categories that make up this year's fourth edition of these awards. So I'm going to turn now directly to the gentleman on my left and ask you very simply, for the benefit of our audience, why were these awards created? Yeah, this award is being created because that's, it's really in line with the mission of a consumer, that is to improve the product in the market. So uh, we pursue this, uh, we accomplish this mission in doing different activity. We, be, we perform a comparative test, uh, we carry out a survey with consumer, 
we organize group purchase as, as we will see later mm -hmm. in the day. Mm -hmm. And in doing this activity, we always challenge the company in improving the product and services. But th this challenge is, is always uh, uh, doing that. We keep always a constructive and collaborative relationship with the company. Mm -hmm. So that is a little bit the, mm, the spirit of this yeah. award. Yeah. And we are really proud of uh, being here for the fourth edition of the Bext Award uh, to show business everywhere that the commitment they have uh, in uh, improving, for instance, uh, the value for money. We, we see one category is value for money and eco-friendliness mm -hmm. uh, and uh, reliability is recognized by consumer organization as a consumer that works on this, in this, in this activity of supporting the consumer in their choice from 70 years. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, that's very important. So th this year, we said this year we will focus value per money. Mm -hmm. It means we want to uh, recognize the company that are able to return to the consumer yeah. the best okay. quality yeah. for a given price. Mm -hmm. uh, we will focus the eco-friendliness. Eco-friendliness is a way to, um, to measure the uh, impact on the environment, but also the, saving, the possible saving mm -hmm. on resources and on money. And reliability is related with the reparation of the appliances. So there is also, a, let me say, an economical dimension also in yeah. the reliability. Okay. So all these three uh, awards um, have uh, the perspective to consider the budget of the family. That in, in this period of high inflation for euro consumers is mm -hmm. really a priority. And and so to award the company that are able to help consumer yeah. in saving money is very important. For Absolutely. Us. And, and to make sure that they're spending that money wisely. And thank you, because you said there, you know, that's the spirit. That's the relationship that we have with these brands. And obviously, we're going to find out who the win well, who the nominees are as we go through the course of the event, but who the winners are at the end. And I like your spirit because you relaxed immediately because you know me now. <laughs> and we had lots of Italian <laughs> hand gestures there. So I was thank really you. happy about that. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for a very comprehensive and clear reply. I'm going to turn to you. And um, the obvious question we heard there uh, from Michele, you know, we've got these comparisons that there is engagement directly with consumers. So just in a nutshell, uh, give us an insight into how, how these are judged. How do these? How yes. do you judge these nominees and come out with sure. the winners? Sure. Uh, as Michele said, uh, we are uh, focusing. Part of our uh, efforts are focused, uh, especially on consumer products, um, and um, we want to verify uh, the quality of the products, but also the value for money and uh, other important uh, aspects, especially environmental aspects. Yeah. So we've been uh, taking uh, all the results uh, that we got from so many different tests, uh, hundreds of tests on over 3,000 products, uh, took them uh, and um, mixed them uh, with the um, consumer surveys uh, that we right. carried out. Uh, we carried out uh, this consumer service on over 10,000 uh, of uh, European consumers. Wow. So we took all of these results, uh, this great amount uh, of data, and uh, we put them uh, in, um, in a really a rank uh, for brands right. uh, yeah. because we really wanted uh, to say we are the best brand. So it's very, it's very, very evidence-based. I yes. think, just so you, if I heard it correctly, you tested 3,000 products, products, did you say? So yes. there's a lot of work. I joked, actually, with Michele last year, you probably don't sleep. I mean, it <laughs> just sort of feels <laughs> it's like this. a lot of work. We are a, yeah. we are a great uh, team. Uh, also, I yeah. mean, uh, as you said before, we are uh, spread all over Europe. Uh, so that really makes uh, the, the products uh, representative for the entire Europe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me turn, uh, just, just, just another question, if I, if I may, and that sort of follows up indeed, because I made that comment, wow, that's a lot of products yeah. to test. It's a lot of work. How is that even possible? I mean, we heard there what is done, but I yeah. mean... Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's important because a single organization will be never able to perform a so large number of testing because mm -hmm. to test the washing machine it costs 2000 euros so it's, yeah. a, it's a, and we publish uh, um, 100 new test washing machine every year 
That's, <laughs> we, we are able to do that because we collaborate, we cooperate with the other consumer organization. Mm -hmm. You mentioned at the DDA consumer, we are five um, consumer organizations, four in Europe, but for performing this big test on large household appliances, for instance, we collaborate also with other consumer organizations in Europe, UK, cons um, Holland, Germany, France. So we are really the consumer organization created a network uh, yeah. of mutual collaboration in order to distribute uh, the cost of this yeah. test. Okay. Just thanks okay. to that, we are able to be really the leader in the, comp the organization, co the consumer organization globally are really the leader in comparative test of products. And that is uh, the only way to do that. Okay, and thank you, because look, I was actually copying your fabulous hand <laughs> gestures there. Now, I don't know if you want to just look down the lens, here is our audience, and you can, because we didn't name those national consumer organisations. Should I yeah. leave that to you? Yeah, I yeah, yeah. So, for the benefit of our audience, yes, uh, yes. what are the names of those it national consumer so organisations? We, we are here in Belgium, where Testachat, Testacop is mm -hmm. the, the consumer organisation that I said, born 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, in Italy, uh, the local organisation, uh, consumer organization is Altro Consumo. Um, in, um, in France, uh, in, sorry, in Spain is uh, OCU, OCU Compra mm -hmm. Maestra, mm -hmm. and in Portugal is Proteste. Uh, so that's are the, the local organization that are, I mean, very recognized in the country as the main uh, reference for support. You talked Brazil? Did you name Brazil it? is protesting also Protest, in Brazil. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. Just making sure they're not leaving you out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very right. much. Just testing your knowledge. That would have been a bit, you know, if you talked so uh, warmly <laughs> about this great network and then, oh, you yeah, couldn't name no, it. So yeah. I just wanted to name check there. Um, one last question, and then I'm going to segue very gently into our first, um, our first session of three, so our first dynamic um, chat, just very briefly for an answer, if I may ask you, uh, Raquel. I suppose, I know, because I'm a consumer and I have increasing demands, because I have increasing knowledge about certainly everything to do with the environment. So do you see brands upping their game? Do you see brands, you know, keeping ahead of the curve? Of course, uh, there is uh, an improvement uh, and there is greater uh, sensitivity to the issue, but uh, still uh, much, uh, of course, can be done. We are here uh, exactly for this reason, to encourage the ones that right. are doing good. Yeah, okay, to encourage the ones that are doing good, but also kind of say, hey, you know, uh, this is where everyone else yes, can be. Yes, um, exactly. Think. Absolutely. Okay, well, I sort of feel we've given you this tantalizing insight with, with my two lovely co-presenters here um, into what the awards cover. And as I said, they will join me. The awards will kick off around 25 past four. So that's uh, uh, our time here in Brussels. Um, but before that, I said, and I mentioned uh, to Michele, we're going to be introducing you to the nominees throughout this event. So it could be a good time to take a look at the nominees in the first category, which, as uh, Michele said, is value for money. So let's see. Oh, yes, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We are going to be showing the nominees in the other two categories. We're going to squish that in between the thematic discussions en route to the award ceremony itself. Now, importantly, back to the now and to crack on with our first discussion. Now, this first discussion tells you absolutely everything you need to know about collective purchases. And I'm ashamed to say that actually I didn't know what collective purchases were before I did the briefing for this event, but I am absolutely thoroughly convinced by the concept and the efficacy, and actually how this puts the power in the hands of the consumer, power and more. But it's not for me to reveal what else, because I've got some fabulous speakers on this panel. You're not going to meet them quite yet because first of all I'd like to give you an insight into the topic of this first session. While the immediate impact of Covid has lowered, it still influences our economy. The postponed spending of consumers 
gave a boost to the demand of products and it also created a huge energy demand. At the same time, critical supply chains were interrupted and the subsequent scarcity created inflation and that inflation was further sharpened by the war in Ukraine. All of that brings uncertainty and even anxiety to consumers, which has a direct impact on their daily lives and also on their budgets. Through collective purchasing schemes, we can negotiate better prices for services on behalf of consumers. In practice, a multidisciplinary team sets up an online auction and invites interested suppliers to make an offer within a specific time frame. By representing a group of consumers who have registered their consumption profiles online, the team offers an attractive market share that providers will fight for. EuroConsumers and its member organizations have a lot of experience in organizing collective purchases of products and services in the best interest of consumers. It is one of the best solutions in crisis times, leading to the most interesting prices for consumers. And also from the market perspective, the online auction is the most transparent trading process. So it is a win-win for all parties. Previous schemes have already given over 1.3 million European consumers an opportunity to save money on electricity and gas. The same principle can be extended to energy efficiency products and self-generation equipment, or even other markets, for instance, telecommunications or petrol. Euro consumers, strength in numbers. And of course, we heard there the words electricity and gas, two words absolutely on everybody's lips at the moment. So great that we've got some good stuff to bring to you on this panel. As I said, as if by magic, look, here they are, here they are. In fact, the gentleman on my right is literally fresh off the plane. Are That's you not? Right. Good yeah. Lord. Yes, he has <laughs> literally streak run like Superman into this studio. So a very warm welcome to you, Pier, uh, Pier Giacomo Sibiano. Thank you. Do you Thank know, you. I thought I was going to say that so fluently and I absolutely <laughs> suddenly did not. And then on my left, I also have uh, Carino Osorio. And here right next to me, I have Sara Elisa Contini. Now, I prefer to let these good people speak for themselves. So a quick introduction from each of you. Um, Hey, why not to our audience? There's your camera right there. So let me start with you, uh, Sara. Yes, um, I'm um, an industrial engineer with more than 10 years experience in, uh, in project management and business development uh, with focus in energy and telco and innovative project. And uh, I work in alto consumo edizioni. That w that, uh, that's great. Actually, you did say to me right at the start, you said, Katrina, I don't tend to talk a lot. I'm very, very concise, and you were. But the key thing is that you are working in altro consumer. That's yeah. what we need to capture. <laughs> thank you so very much. And Karina, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to be here. A special welcome for those that are attending and listening us right now. So my name is Karina Osorio. I'm from Deck Protest in uh, Portugal, and I coordinate in Euroconsumers, a business unit that supports all the countries for the development of collective purchase. Uh, my knowledge base is uh, enterprise management, so with more than 15 years experience in business process improvement, process automation. Um, and I, I start on bank industry, then spend a lot of time on telecommunications. And I enjoy Euro Consumers all uh, world for the last eight years. Okay. Thank you so very much. And it sounds literally like you have all of the requisite skills to be a part of what we are going to talk about, because it is, it is quite complex. I mean, it's complex to put together, but, but more on that in a moment, uh, because I'm now going to turn to the gentleman on my right, uh, Pier Giacomo Sibiano. And of course, um, uh, this lovely gentleman, you are coming from the other side of things. You are yeah. a critical piece of this puzzle. So I think if the camera can turn towards you, other, uh, I will let you introduce yourself to the lovely audience at home. Thank you so very much. And that one with the white sticker is yours. Of course. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. Um, my name is Pier Giacomo Sibiano. Um, I'm responsible. I'm the head of uh, uh, institutional and, and uh, regulatory affairs 
uh, of uh, Tremagi Group, which is uh, which owns uh, Illumia and Wikiwi, which are uh, two energy and gas seller uh, in Italy. And uh, together, they represent uh, the first family business in the energy and gas sector in Italy. So we are quite proud of it, and I am quite excited. Uh, to work uh, to work for them because it's very uh, young company the middle age uh, th the mean age of our company is uh, like uh, 35 uh, years old so it's a very uh, very nice uh, environment in which work and uh, and so mm, to be here in being here is also thanks to to the company okay Thank you to you. Honestly, I won't be insulted by what you just said about 35-year-olds. It's a young company with 35-year-olds. <laughs> I'm on the other side of 50, so we're not even going to go there. But, you know, we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, all right, we saw the video. So um, let, me, let me come first, if I may, to you, Karina. We saw the video. Let me give you just a couple of minutes to expand, you know, in your own words for our audience, what exactly a collective purchase is. What's it all about? Well, a collective purchase is an action that brings together consumers that are usually or particularly interested in a specific product or service, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pushing markets towards better offers. So we have been doing this um, inside and outside the Euro consumers in different markets, mm -hmm. either because it's difficult sometimes to access to a specific product or because there's not enough knowledge about its benefits or advantages, sure. or because the market changes suddenly with yeah. significant impacts on consumers' pockets. So putting together these consumers uh, make them, uh, at this moment, a very interesting market share, which naturally the providers are willing to fight yeah. for. Yeah. And this is where we come in. Euro consumers associations have been negotiating on behalf of the consumers for the last eight to 10 years mm -hmm. um, to, to give them the, the best offers uh, they can. And um, we are talking about more than 150 actions developed. And the good news is that at the end, we can get a good offer for the consumers, for sure, better than if they went alone to search the market. Okay. Thank you. Um, so clear. And may I just say and ask you, because we heard it in the video, you've just said it. So we're talking about energy now, but apart from that, where else might this come into play? With what other kinds of products? Yeah, you can, uh, we can be, t uh, be talking about uh, renewable energy products, for instance. Yes. We can be talking about insurance, uh, health insurance, travel insurance, inclusive bank products. Okay, so, so really very, yeah. very wide array. And exactly. I, I like what you said there. You said providers are willing to fight for their... So we'll see, we'll, we'll see. That will be a question I'll be asking you in a moment. But first of all, um, very important to hear a specific example from Italy, because I think that will allow our audience to be able to kind of unpack it in their heads how it works. So just just talk through yeah, concrete the example. Uh, yes, uh, the most important experience in Italy is uh, the energy purchase group uh, that's called um, Abbassa la Bolletta. And um, this year uh, is ongoing the seventh edition. Okay. And uh, at the moment we have uh, 80,000 consumers involved in the campaign. And uh, uh, we have uh, about uh, 6, 000, uh, 7 thousand uh, new contracts. So okay, it's wow. a very important uh, number. And um, uh, th this is important because uh, we, we are able to give a solution also in this period uh, with the crisis of energy yeah. market uh, and yeah. um, it's a proof that uh, we have a solution for the consumers that are interested in saving money and changing energy provider. Yeah. Uh, to give you an idea, um, from 2013 uh, to 2020, we involved uh, 600,000 consumers in uh, Bassa la Bolletta edition, and uh, uh, we, ha uh, we had uh, uh, about uh, 168,000 uh, new contracts. So oh it's wow. a very important okay. uh, number. <laughs> and it's a very important auction, yeah. as you yeah. told me. I mean, it's very, it's, it's very important. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Big impact on uh, consumers. Big impact on consumers. Yeah. Well, let's just hold that thought, and I'm going to ask more about that impact and the benefits just in a moment. But I just want to bring you in. You know, we heard that you know providers are willing to fight to be part of this. Um, just very briefly, how how do things work from the provider perspective? Then, just fill in the gaps there. 
It's, uh, it's, I, I think the experience with Ultra Consumo I, is, is very, very interesting. It's very even useful mm -hmm. I, 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 for us because it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to, uh, let's say, main the, cap, main the gap that uh, often uh, companies have in the relationship with uh, customers. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I just uh, give you some example, uh, right at the beginning of the auction, once we win the auctions, that's the first stage when uh, Altra Consumo and uh, WikiWi uh, talk uh, uh, every day, talk about uh, what about the perfect terms and conditions of our okay. customers and how, how to explain our offer, uh, how to, how to get, get on with them, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and this is a very good opportunity to improve our offer, to improve our policies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and secondly, um, after, let's say, six months, if everything has gone right, and normally it is, uh, we, we just uh, we just uh, uh, talk if we have s some problems, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and and that's an important thing that uh, maybe we can talk uh, talk later. But I think this is the the key point. Uh, the key point is that through Ultra Consumo we can reach uh, customers uh, and we can uh, convince them that we have a good offer. But at the, the same time, without Ultra Consumo, we could not improve our uh, our offer, our prices. Mm -hmm. as we could otherwise. That's interesting. And I think, I mean, I will say, I will look at, you know, I, I, at our audience, I mean, certainly me as a consumer, I would say that must be, it sounds very heartening because we do live in a time where there isn't a tremendous amount of trust. We're looking at some very big actors in the market, not least utilities, and thinking, mm, there's a lot of profits. What's being, s you know, what am I getting out of this? And to hear that and say, you know, we are, it's a good way it forces us to improve. We want to improve. That's absolutely critical. And I think you're going to be saying a little bit more, like you said, on that in a yeah. moment. Let's just switch back, if, if I may, to the consumer. And I, I said, you know, for the benefit of our, of our lovely audience, let's just articulate three or four of those clear benefits, you know. Yes, I can identify three benefits for uh, consumers. The first one is uh, good quality and good prices. Uh, as uh, Pier Giacomo says, said, uh, we analyze all the terms and conditions of all the providers that uh, are involved in the campaign and admit only the ones uh, that obtain uh, good results. So we can start from a good level of general quality and then we can work on prices in order to take it uh, as cheaper as possible. The second one advantage, in my opinion, is uh, to make the consumers uh, aware. We work a lot uh, to give information uh, like contents or um, um, expense estimation or uh, quality um, evaluation of the providers in order to make the consumers, uh, um, to give the consumers all the information they need uh, to take the best uh, possible yes. decision. Yes. So this is uh, an important point uh, of the campaign. And the uh, third benefit is uh, make the, um, the consumers satisfied because uh, it's uh, our <laughs> main, <laughs> main <aim. laughs> yes, good. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we try to adjust the market uh, in order to, to obtain uh, uh, products and support uh, uh, providers uh, that uh, are in mind uh, what is important yeah. for our consumers. Uh, so we work in this direction. Indeed, and as, as, as Karina said at, at, the out, at the outset, there could be many reasons why this is done. And one is changes in the market, another is not enough knowledge. I've got to say, do both of you ladies then have to read lots of terms and conditions? <laughs> Just honest to God, that would, I, I salute you for that alone. If that's, I mean, who, who, who ever reads lots of terms and conditions? I don't know, and, and we all should. Um, let me just stick with you a moment, momentarily. Obviously, feel free to, to raise a hand. We have, you can see how much time we have there in, in our conversation, but if you want to chip in, you're welcome. Um, I'm just sticking with the consumers a moment because you said, you know, we work very hard to reach them and we work very hard to give them information. Yeah. Um, how do you reach them? How do you make them aware? As I said somewhat shamefully at the beginning, I don't know if it's really I need to be shameful. Whew, I didn't know anything about this yeah. initiative, this kind of initiative. So, you know, how, how that must take some work. Uh, okay, uh, we started in advance uh, with the strong investment in communication and um, asking to consumers to join, to join the, the campaign and uh, subscribe it using a, a dedicated website. Okay. Uh, with a large number of consumers, we, we invite the providers to, to participate to the, uh, to, to 
the initiative and share with them the rules and the, the requirements to participate, so quality and so on. And uh, uh, with the trust that Altro Consumo has uh, in Italy in uh, energy market, we can, uh, okay. yes, we can, we have, normally we have uh, important player uh, at national level, so we can cover all, uh, all okay, the territory in Italy. And um, we organize uh, with the, <laughs> the help of uh, Karina and uh, his team uh, an online auction. And uh, with the, the auction, we identify the best energy offers in power and gas. Mm -hmm. So with the winning offer, we can uh, uh, make the, the offer available to the subscription. And uh, we communicate to every um, consumer that's involved in campaign uh, the estimation of the saving that okay. they can obtain with the, the winning uh, tariff. And uh, we communicate uh, this, uh, this possibility, this opportunity to the consumers involved. And uh, at the end, uh, we give uh, them uh, about five months uh, to okay. think about it, uh, to inform uh, about all the characteristics of the offers. And in the same time, we work with the provider in order to uh, reach uh, uh, new, new consumers, okay. new opportunities to expand the, the business, uh, but uh, in terms of um, clients for the providers, but also uh, to save money for users at okay. the end. So it's uh, uh, a work that uh, we do together with the provider okay so it's quite so it's yeah. okay I will come to you as the provider in just a moment just coming back to um, Karina if there's anything because of course when I used the word auction earlier I sort of jumped the gun because you've you've explained in more detail what actually happens in terms of this auction how a price is set um, you know the lowest price is put out there but anything else that you wanted to talk about in terms of the auction and the platform to actually facilitate that in, in fact um, there's a lot of resources that are yeah. needed to uh, make all these um, uh, all these solutions available we we hear Sarah talking about the websites about an auction tool mm. um, and all this activity needs to be very well coordinated yeah. and uh, that's how we we have been doing it for the last years okay thank you I'm gonna come to you and so sort of Sara kind of pulled you in herself by saying you've got this very close relationship with the consumer organization. Um, I sort of just again, we're going back a little step. How, how did you come to be involved? You know, how, how did you come to be engaged in this? Uh, yes, well, I mean, Wikiwi, uh, since the beginning, um, uh, Chose to chose to um, a positioning very 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 clear, which was uh, we we start selling energy and gas uh, only online, so without any kind of intermediation and, and, and so on, and in a very innovative way. So uh, allowing for different uh, uh, ways of payment uh, and. Uh, uh, let the customer let into the customer to uh, change the uh, uh, number of bills in a year and inf and and thanks to this uh, uh, they can uh, uh, save um, even more money and so on yep. and and of course uh, oh thank you for thank you to this uh, we also um, started offering a very competitive uh, prices okay and so uh, in, i i think in uh, in 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 many in most uh, uh, web comparator we've been the the, the the first one the second one anyway one of the best and so uh, they just uh, they just uh, ultra consumer just called us and uh, invite us to to participate and this is how it works i mean in in italy uh, for example even in lumia which is the other the other company i represent uh, he, 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 he worked at the same time so the, the association of of, of customer who, who are uh, quite uh, reliable they know who are the, 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 the providers who can give you what, they, what okay. they're looking for. Okay. So they just yeah. call them, okay? And then, then there's the competition. Yeah. And you are also involved, as I understand it, um, because I talked you know, with, with all of you before, before we got together here, I talked, talked with all of you online. Um, you are also doing that push towards the consumer because uh, we heard there that it's a lot of work. It's, it's very strategic work um, to raise awareness and say, here's this opportunity. That's also something you do on your site because all of it is digital, yeah. is it not? Um, and uh, tell me, 
a little bit more about that. Forgive me, I wasn't very clear there. Tell me a little bit more about that from your perspective. And also just a moment again, going back to this, uh, the benefits for you, because you said it pushes you, you know, to offer those prices, but it's also more than that. It's, it's quality of service. Yeah. Is it not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, I, I would say the benefits for 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 us uh, are, are quite clear. The first one is that we increase in very short time the number of customers, and this is very important for us because uh, we can uh, we can afford in this way in a very easy way. We can afford all the the fixed costs and so on. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the second the second point is that we increase the quality of our customers because we experience uh, uh, with ultra consumo that the, 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 the customer uh, who's coming from uh, ultra consumo they are uh, let's say high quality customers which means they know what they're talking about they pay on time which is a quite important thing in the energy <laughs> gas sector and 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 so uh, and the third point is uh, is a point of reputation so being uh, a winner of a uh, um, uh, an auction managed by an association of, co of, uh, of uh, consumers is, uh, is an important indicator of quality of the provider. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the, 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 the issue of uh, not only price but also quality, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is a crucial point. Um, many times, uh, even uh, the, the, the regulators in, 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 in most countries, they, they, they try to uh, introduce uh, many, many, many uh, tools to improve the comparison of prices. But this is not only prices, it's also quality. What does that mean? That means uh, how quick I answer to the question, yeah. how I, uh, I am understandable to the customers. Um, th this, th this, uh, the language I use, the la the, the channel I How use, accessible uh, you website, are. Uh, yeah. email, chat, and so on. So this yeah. is this is something uh, that uh, customers are uh, intention to pay a bit a bit more, but yeah. they want to get it. Yes, and I think as we as we discussed, um, you know, you had said, you know, this helps differentiate, you know, within the marketplace. That is a very very important differentiator. And as I understand it, some some customers might switch so some existing customers might be part of that auction and thereby gain from lower prices but it also enables you to get more customers is that as i understand it so it's, it's yeah. it works okay both ways i'm going to bring karina back in and i'm going to rewind 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 <laughs> to something you said right at the start <laughs> when i asked you the first question what's it all about and you did say that you have been working with other organizations outside consumers i think you used the word internal external so can you just clarify that for yes us? in fact i, I was uh, talking about other consumer rights associations which are um, following the same purpose uh, of getting it easier for the consumers to purchase uh, good products or switch for better services. Mm -hmm. But behind this common goal, there is in fact um, a whole infrastructure, so resources, I mean, IT people, the tools like the auction tool that we have been uh, to talking about, uh, which might be not so easy for other organizations, especially the smaller ones. And again, here we can provide the services because we have the whole framework prepared. One very current example of this is ClearX Projects. ClearX Project is a European Union funded Horizon 2020 project. Very well. So you, I saw you put your rhythm there, <laughs> there and then I interrupted <laughs> you. Tell if I got it in the right place. <laughs> okay. And yeah. by the way, mentioned last year by Ursula von der Leyen oh, on okay. her opening yes. speech for okay. sustainability Did week. Did you do a small cheer? It's yeah, yeah okay. for sure it's in okay. fact important and you are we are making the difference. But I it's a project that is running uh, several collective purchases oh, okay. schemes right. uh, to make it easier for the consumers to um, uh, purchase efficiency, efficiency energy products and renewable right. energy technologies in their homes. And we are part of a consortium and our role is uh, to support some uh, organizations to develop these collective purchases so okay. we are helping them to make to, to work on this change of energy consumption choices in countries like uh, Bulgaria uh, 
North Macedonia, Cyprus, okay. Lithuania, okay. Slovakia and Slovenia. Okay. You're helping them read terms and conditions, aren't you? You're helping them, you're giving <laughs> master classes in reading T and C's, that's what I think. Um, I'm just keeping my eye on the clock. I just, uh, just to organize, I have some more questions from you. And actually we also harvested some questions um, from some audience members ahead of the event, which I will want to put to our lovely speakers. But just something I didn't ask, and I, I think it's always a good one in this, this you know, world where the digital transformation is, is, is so accelerated in, in all domains. Um, how is it if I am, you know, these auctions, we've got digital platforms, how does it work perhaps for older, the older generation who might be those who really want to be a part of this, you know, low price offering or potential very low price offering? How do you have any experience with that? Do you think it precludes their engagement or? No, I, I, probably I'm launching something on you for which you don't have stats, but I wondered if there was anything to say about, you know, generations that are maybe online less often, less... Yes, uh, I think that uh, in Ultra Consumer, an example, we, we have uh, a telephone service uh, and uh, we can uh, give uh, support by telephone also to these okay. people in order to help them in subscription and in all the phases ah, okay. of, the, uh, of the activation of the contract. So we have uh, a very strong call center that helps also this kind of, uh, of people, this uh, whole generation. Who, who might need a different kind, yeah. of, you might need to hear a human voice sometimes. And I think you said you are predominantly digital, but you don't keep that out i mean obviously as part of your not. service offering there is an engagement by voice too yeah 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 of course so we, we give uh, we give support uh, in case in case of uh, of, uh, of requests uh, but uh, uh, again our positioning the positioning of wikiwi is quite clear so it's very very digital and uh, uh, i mean our bet was to invest on this generation which uh, will be let's say the new older generation, okay? So uh, uh, I, I, we don't have so much experience on this kind of customers uh, because of this, because the position is, uh, is, is so clear. This does not mean that there are no older generation uh, uh, w w with that get in touch with the digitalization, but it's, uh, of course, is, uh, is lower than, um, than, than, the, than young people. Okay. No, indeed. I have a 92-year-old friend on Facebook. I'm actually not on Facebook <laughs> in any useful way at all, but she is there and every day. Um, okay. So, uh, I think we should have, let me come to, if we have it, we should have a first question, I think, that we've, um, as I said, we just sort of put it out there to harvest from the audience, and I'm having a look. Now, the first question, uh, are you witnessing a real shift in consumer attitudes towards environmental sustainability? That came sort of out of left field in this, but I wanted to see where that sat in this, um, in this context. Karina, um, over to you first. Yes, I, I would say yes. Uh, probably not in the rhythm that everybody would like, but uh, if we look to the results of, for instance, the previous edition of CLEAR, because yep. this CLEAR X is the third edition of this uh, program, um, we have 29,000, around 29,000 renewable energy installations in right. consumers' homes. So, of course, there's still a lot of work to do, and especially in what concerns to some barrier, actual barriers that still exist in different ways uh, in different countries. But uh, what we can see is that as much information you give, structured information, it's much easier for the consumer to take the, ch the decision and change. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. And also to mention, of course, there is still all sorts and, and of... of of issues to accelerate uptake and, and you called it obstacles, I think, or barriers. And thank you because I'll be having a look, you know, a little bit in that area with my next guest speaker on my next okay. session, but I okay. won't reveal who it is yet. <laughs> um, over to you very briefly. Did you want to comment on that? I think it, well, I mean, I mean, we I think it would be for you to comment. Yeah, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I would say that we are so convinced about this, of the shift um, uh, to the to the renewable energy as, uh, and so sustainability as a whole that we bet on it. I mean, we we uh, really bet on 
uh, young generation and uh, sustainability. Uh, we, 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 we sell only uh, green energy, we participate and promote um, different day in, in Milan, which is the city where we are based, uh, a day of uh, collecting plastic in the streets. Mm -hmm. We invested, uh, I, I would say, one year ago in a company who make a uh, jacket with a plastic collector from the sea. I, I, have a, I have a jacket right there then, if you want to okay. see that. <laughs> and so... Did uh, it keep you warm in your epic yeah. journey? To <laughs> yeah, exactly, to exactly, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so the, the answer, I think, is, uh, is a definitely yes, and we, we are trying to, to, to sustain sustainability. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to nick that. Um, I think we should have a second question that's coming up now. I hope so on the screen. Uh, different. Um, do you think that the current energy challenges brought about by the war in Ukraine will boost interest in an uptake of collective purchases? Why don't I come to you first? <laughs> Yes, uh, yes. Uh, the media are talking a lot about the, the energy crisis and the situation that comes from the, the war in Ukraine. And um, also the consumer are more focused on this, uh, this point, uh, this theme. And um, the, the numbers of Abbas La Bolletta and in general f of uh, ultra consumer contents uh, about it uh, are the proof that uh, there is a uh, there is a um, big attention on uh, on these points, and um, I think that with the uh, results that uh, we obtain, uh, we can also give uh, a solution or an opportunity to continue to save money, also in uh, uh, in period in which uh, the situation uh, doesn't help. Yeah, thank you. And and I mean, is it a way also op of opening a or in terms of raising awareness in general about, because you spoke about the insurance sector, you spoke about many other different areas, healthcare. So what do you think? Is, is there going to be, do you think the situation now could potentially boost? Sort of upset or raise awareness, potentially boost uptake? I think we are going to hear several times more than ever the word price so and saving. So, yes, for sure, uh, we are under pressure to provide more solutions in different sectors. And for you? Of course, uh, there, is a, there is a real boost of uh, 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 trying to know much more about uh, energy and how how the market works and so on this is definitely definitely right i mean i dealt with a uh, press office as well in my company till a couple of months ago uh, one years ago in the in the in the, in the national press there was uh, very very few uh, article about energy now is everything about energy <laughs> so uh, people are are knowing much more than than before and uh, and i think yeah the 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 the, the next step is to uh, uh, to see this this experience to grow and grow again okay thank you now i'm going to give you the opportunity again that's my job to keep an eye on the clock and just to have a steer also, um, if our next speaker is already in the house, so I might get a little steer on that from our lovely technicians, if our lovely next speaker is in the house. But while I do, um, while I do just clarify that, and I'm getting the yes, so that's good, a thumbs up. Uh, any last word? What did we not get to say? What uh, either you didn't get to say, or a last word to encourage consumers to look at this or spread the word? What? What didn't you get to say or what would you like to say as a kind of a closing takeaway for for our lovely audience? Um, it's <laughs> it's hard to find. Uh, <laughs> yes, but I think that uh, it's uh, a good moment to change uh, our mind and uh, start to thinking about a different way to live and uh, also for the consumers, uh, a different way to buy products yeah. and services. That was a perfect last word. <laughs> I'd be horrified, like, why did you ask me that? I was in a panic. Yeah, you, I could see in your eyes. And yet, absolutely, it is the time also for consumers to be able to look yeah. at different ways of purchasing for you. Well, 
I, I can say that if you have an idea of how to provide something in what concerns to products and services better for, for the consumers, but you don't know how to do it, uh, you can come to us, you can talk to us, and we might find together a, a solution because, in fact, we, we are used to do these kind of things. And it's not only consumer rights associations, other organizations can work with us together uh, in this kind of activity. Thank you. And they can talk to you, as they said. For sure. You do talk. It's not all. OK. Uh, anything else that you would like to um, I, I would just say that uh, this is a great opportunity also to be aware of uh, the capacity that customers have also to uh, think, rethink uh, the, 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 the way they use energy, how much the mm -hmm. energy they use. And, um, and, and I think uh, association of customers can, can help on that. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good opportunity to be, uh, I mean, to, 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 to do this step uh, towards sustainability, not, not just on the side of uh, which kind of energy we product, but also on the side of how much we consume. Thank you very much. And I think that's a, a very good point because I think that, you know, there has been a lot of talk, I th uh, you know, started perhaps more in the EU bubble, but a lot of talk in general about prosumers, you know, in, 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 you know, very in the last years of, of which, and sometimes you sort of feel a bit like, oh, gosh, okay, choice. Um, where do I look? What do I do? Do I want to change? How do I change? Can I trust? And um, what you're saying is this, is, this is, this really is a mechanism where I think it makes it easier to make you know, as you're saying, those kinds of choices. And, and just to echo, you know, the words that we had at the beginning, stronger together, I think it is a very, very good example of the power of the collective. So I can bring this lovely discussion to a close. If you've all exhausted your brilliance, <laughs> then uh, so much thanks to you. I cannot believe you literally leapt off a coach <laughs> and into this studio. So honestly, major kudos to you. And uh, thank you so much for being here, uh, Pierre thank Giacomo. Thank you, thank you for your patience. Oh, no, no, no worries. I'm sure I must have stressed you out horribly. Where are you? Um, lovely, Sarah, thank you so very much to you. Um, and Karina, uh, beautiful answers. Uh, thank you for you know really describing to our audience what collective purchases are. And I hope doing more than that, I hope enthusing you to check it out, either in this arena of energy or in any of the other arenas that Karina talked about. So thank you to our wonderful speakers. And very shortly, I'm going to move us on. Now, I'm going to move us on to our second discussion on energy, which is actually going to be a fireside chat. But before I do that, as I promised, we'd be looking at the nominees in the three categories uh, before we get to the awards along the way. And now I'd like to show you who the nominees are in the eco-friendly category. Excited? I hope so, because you need to stay tuned to find out who the winners are. And there is one more category to come uh, in which we will reveal the nominees. But first, a chat on the topic, as I said before, literally on everybody's, well, lips and minds. The current crisis in the UK, in the Ukraine, absolutely challenging repercussions outside of the horrendous theatre of war itself. The talk is all about energy and how we are going to get through the next seasons. Will the lights stay on? Will we have heat? And importantly, if the answer to both those questions is yes, then how are we going to pay for it? So I'd like you to take a look at this scene setter first before I invite my special guest from the European Commission, DG Energy. She is head of unit for consumers, local initiatives, just transition, Adela Tesarova. But first, let's have a look at this video. Global warming is a fact, and at the same time, we find ourselves in the middle of an energy crisis with soaring energy prices. Euroconsumers intensifies its activities to match 
these and other challenges faced by consumers. Adding insulation and upgrading heating systems are very effective at improving efficiency, but they often involve considerable effort and investment. On the other hand, choosing the right domestic household products and using them correctly can yield energy and cost savings without a large sacrifice. But making the best choice can be difficult for consumers faced with a plethora of options, including new and unfamiliar products at high prices. And although the new energy label is a good starting point, it doesn't always tell the whole story. EuroConsumers has been testing home appliances for decades in independent labs, always using real consumer behavior as a basis. Now we have added environmental tests so that the impact of products on the environment, as well as their life cycle and their repairability, also can influence the final test results. Armed with this knowledge, consumers can then make objective and informed decisions about choosing an appliance. Once a choice is made, Euro consumers also provide all the information needed to use the product in the best possible way, maintain it properly, and extend its life in line with the principles of circular economy. Euro consumers, because the greenest and most cost effective energy is the energy you don't use. And now it's my great pleasure to give a very warm welcome to Adela Tesarova. Um, now, Adela Tesarova is an economist, uh, an economist a la base, I think, is that correct? With experience in the Commission working on energy, on climate, on the environment policies, also EU economic governance and taxation. And I think you must need all of those skills at the moment with what's going on. I absolutely don't doubt it. And I really do want to say a huge thank you for being with us. I mean, my God, you've got your work cut out and I don't think the audience is remotely surprised uh, to hear that. May I just, if I may give a quick overview, just for our audience, a, a few words if they're not familiar sort of from the policy perspective what's been going and I know you're going to fill in a lot of the gaps um, obviously in mid-September if I'm correct the Commission proposed its first set of measures in, in a regulation uh, focusing very much on a revenue cap for the for the energy inframarginal companies so all of those producing electricity from from renewables and from from nuclear and a crisis contribution from fossil fuel energy companies and then there was also mandatory demand reduction measures and there's all sorts of things under discussion at the moment but critically tomorrow um, in an extraordinary energy council eu energy ministers are coming together to talk about all this and more with the aim of reaching a political agreement on a proposal for the regulation on emergency uh, interventions to address high energy prices. So we really have got you at this absolutely critical moment. Um, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, everybody's saying, you know, Europe, right, you know, please act. Um, but is that entirely fair? Because as I think I've demonstrated, there has, there's a lot been going on. Uh, so do you want to fill us in on a little bit of that, please? Okay, well, thank you and thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, well, I would uh, maybe start um, a bit more in the past, because in fact, uh, Europe or EU has been working on improving sustainability of our energy supply and strengthening the security of supply yep. uh, for at least um, um, at least two decades, if not more. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we have had the objective to reduce the, uh, the energy demand in the economy. We have the objective to uh, in increase the share of renewable energy. Yeah. Um, and we had the objective to diversify the supply sources that, uh, that Europe imports. These are long-standing objectives of EU policy. And uh, they have been in place uh, well since I work uh, for the Commission myself. And um, have we fully achieved these objectives? Uh, probably not, because if we did, we wouldn't be in the current situation or at least we would be less vulnerable uh, to, uh, to the energy crisis, which is linked to the Ukrainian war. Um, and uh, we are in, uh, Europe is in a very weak situation, uh, unfortunately, due to our dependency on Russian supplies. Um, and uh, there were uh, wake up calls in the past. We could talk about 2009, yes. where Russia cut us off for one month yes. yeah. from our gas supplies. Mm. Mm. Uh, what have we done? Uh, we have built more pipelines to Russia. Uh, the second uh, scare came in 2014, where Russia um, uh, invaded uh, crime, Crimea, and we have introduced first sanctions. 
But again, we continued building pipelines uh, to Russia because Russian gas was cheaper than uh, other gas uh, globally. So, um, I mean, Europe is partly responsible. But I say Europe, I would say all of us, including uh, you know, all the member states with the decisions uh, that they have taken. But OK, we have been working on these things for many years uh, and now it's obvious uh, that we need to uh, work on them faster. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, the Commission has, um, since the war started in February, has taken a number of measures. Uh, we have, we have uh, initiated kind of speeding up the European Green Deal yep. to, fa yep. to have more renewables, mm -hmm. more energy efficiency and much faster than we originally thought. This is all in the plans. We are speeding up the permitting procedures through legislation at EU level to make it easier for people to invest in renewables. Uh, we have had a lot of extraordinary uh, energy councils. We have had a lot of extraordinary European councils where the leaders come together to discuss what to do. And the Commission is coming up with additional measures. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we have proposed measures to help member states generate additional revenues from the electricity sector and to enhance the toolbox of measures member states have at their disposal to help consumers. Okay. Um, that's what, uh, what if hopefully will be agreed tomorrow at the Extraordinary Energy Council. And now we are looking at the gas market. But of course the gas market is more difficult because the gas market is a global market. Yes. And if Europe decides to provide a cap on the prices for which we are ready or uh, for which we, we are ready to buy gas from our trading partners, which is of course more than Russia, mm -hmm. um, we, of course, need to have a guarantee that these tr partners will still supply us because we are dependent on yeah. natural gas, unfortunately, still. So it is a delicate balance. It's it is a, a delicate uh, balance. Yeah. It is yeah. not an internal gas market. Yeah. It is a global gas market. Yeah. And so just to say, I mean, for those that might, you know, at home be, be listening, they might be familiar. These are all, if they want to find out more about this, and particularly when you talk about diversifying supply, uh, accelerating, um, you know, this rollout of renewables, you know, they're pushing on the energy efficiency. All of that is also part of Repower EU. And then we've also got that fantastic October toolbox which is also providing emergency support it's quite specific and that also has a packet of measures so for those of you i uh, you know who would like to be very very concrete on these those are the places that's what you need to be having a look at um, despite that and you say you know katrina this has been going back decades but sure we continue doing some actions that have led us to be in this place all of us collectively took decisions um, consumers are still facing these very, very high prices. You know, we heard, you know, a sort of von der Leyen talk in the State of the Union. I mean, is there anything else that you need to bring us up to speed or even perhaps uh, reassure uh, those people at home of what else is going on? Hmm. Um. Uh, yes, I mean, the action that um, the, the EU has been promoting or has been pursuing um, together with member states in the current context, um, and as you said, prices started increasing last autumn due to the COVID recovery. Yeah, so energy prices started going up. Um, the, the, the action has always been on two fronts, or let's say three fronts. First front is what we can do in the very short term yes. to make it possible for people to pay energy bills. Yes. And of course, the capacity to pay energy bills uh, depends on our income. Uh, this situation also depends on what type of energy contract we have as a consumer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are consumers uh, who are on long term contracts. They signed them in 2020. For yes. example, yes. They are, I, I still have uh, friends or people around me who have these contracts. And of course, these contracts are very cheap. Yeah. yeah, these contracts come uh, at they have a renewal times. And of course, it's clear that any renewal uh, will mean an increase. Yeah. Then there are consumers who have been, maybe without even knowing it, on more variable contracts mm -hmm. that every three months or every month the price changes. These consumers have felt uh, the impact very quickly. I'm one of those because I have never, never really understood what I have signed. Okay. <laughs> ah, you, <laughs> didn't that, you, did, uh, you didn't hear me on the last panel, did you? Talking about terms and conditions. I was saying to the lovely lady, so uh, you must be the only ever people in the world. <gasps> But who has ever checked terms of conditions of our energy uh, contracts? Because they were always cheap. Yes. If not for everyone, but for majority of population, the energy contracts were not a big deal. It's not like signing a mortgage, right? Everyone reads every word, but the energy contract is something which was manageable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a small part of our, uh, you know, uh, rental costs or house, household costs. Of course, there have always been uh, people 
who have struggled with their energy bills. That's clear, because um, people on low income have uh, already before this crisis came, people uh, were not able to pay energy bills. Mm -hmm. That's why we have legislation. We have uh, we do a lot of work on helping people out of energy poverty. But okay, that's the first trend. Uh, making sure people uh, can uh, pay their energy bills. And of course, this question is becoming more and more acute as uh, the, uh, the divorce situation continues in Ukraine mm -hmm. and there is nervosity in the markets and, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. The second strand is the more medium to, to longer term, help people um, renovate their houses, install renewable, uh, and uh, get into renewable energy so that we are all less dependent yes. on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. This takes time. It will not happen overnight. Mm -hmm. and, also, so, and also Europe has particularly old housing stock, does it not? I yes. mean, in terms of buildings yes. and all of the energy lost, yes. it is. I mean, you, you have a, anyway, I interrupted you, but there was a, a, a big sort of effort in terms of renovation on that. I mean, that has yeah. been very but much on the commission's radar. But what was missing maybe is the kind of scare because people didn't think about um, building renovation in these terms mm -hmm. until recently, mm -hmm. precisely because most of us were paying our energy bills without major problems. Yeah. But of course, the moment my energy bill doubles or triples, mm -hmm. um, first I start complaining or I'm, I'm scared or, you know, and the second thing is I try to look for solutions, which is of course a positive thing because people are um, waking up to this question is my house sustainable? Is the way I live sustainable? Mm -hmm. Can I live like this for the future? The answer is no. So, you got, so, that was the, so that's the medium term. That's the medium term. About the short term alleviation, yes. medium term energy efficiency. And the and third bit is to secure enough um, supplies for Europe to get over this winter and next winter. So in the very short term, we will still be dependent on natural gas. Hence, uh, member states, the EU, our energy companies, we are trying to secure alternative sources of uh, natural gas mm -hmm. for the economy. So that's the three strands. So make, m ensure that energy is still affordable for people, that we can cover our energy needs. Mm -hmm. And energy is as necessary as water, right? Uh, water, electricity, these are basic needs for every household. Mm -hmm. So we have to ensure people can afford it, at least to a certain degree. Second thing, we have to help people make their houses sustainable for the future. And third, we have to secure, at least in the short term, enough natural gas so that we can survive the winter. So, and uh, as I said, I use the word, you know, delicate conversations. I mean, it strikes me if you if you sort of look at it in a tremendously um, idealistic, hopeful way, you think, gosh, you know, the EU, Europe, right. We are well positioned to kind of help each other out in terms of energy supply in this period but it is delicate. There is all of these issues about setting caps, you explained, you know. Um, do you think that, that, that more of this, you know, are we going to get closer to, to an agreement on that? Price setting caps, is that, is that what we think is gonna come out of tomorrow's meeting? Um, well, uh, I mean, the solidarity in Europe starts with uh, being able to share um, our, our stock, our, our supply, among each other and if there is a member state who might end up short during winter are the other member states going to help so that's the first pillar on which mm -hmm. the eu has been working on and we had an extraordinary uh, energy council in july which has uh, has ha has agreed on on certain measures in this area yeah how we are gonna mm -hmm. um how, how would we address an emergency in europe and how we would activate solidarity between member states and that's of course strength of the eu that we can help each other but it's also true that no member state is in a very comfortable position that's clear that's the first trend and the second trend is um, um how can we help member states be able to support consumers given that uh, energy prices are going up. So for electricity, uh, the, for the electricity market, which is an internal EU market, mm -hmm. which we completely control. Um, and it is an important market because um, if there is a shortage of electricity in one part of the EU, we are able to deliver, uh, yep. member states can help each other. Mm -hmm. So within this European market, the commission proposed member states additional ways how to capture some of the um, extraordinary rents which some of the energy companies are generating in the crisis. So we have proposed a European way of doing it together so that there is no um, a competition between member states right. and that companies are treated in the same way across the EU. So we have proposed how to extract these rents mm -hmm. 
and channel them to consumers. Right. Yeah, so that's the electricity part. And then discussion is what can we do about how prices of gas, high, prices of gas are very high because uh, we are in a war situation. We have a war at the border of the EU. We have imposed sanctions on Russia. Uh, at the, uh, on the other side, such, uh, Russia is de facto imposing sanctions on us uh, through energy uh, because we are dependent on, on, mm -hmm. on, uh, on Russian gas. So in this situation, um, it is a bit more complex. What can we do about high gas prices? Because prices of gas are high because there is shortage, there is scarcity in the market. Mm -hmm. Hence, prices are high. Um, so what can we do about that? So that's the discussion the energy ministers will have tomorrow. It's not the first time they are discussing it. They've been discussing this regularly. I um, think they're right in the spotlight, though, of consumer, city, let's say, yeah. citizen, consumer. You know, they're right in the headlights, aren't they? But it's, they, again, they're? two things. How much Europe pays for the gas we import and how much consumers pay for the gas they consume. Uh, so, and that's why the Commission proposed certain ways for member states to get additional revenues, mm -hmm. which would be channeled to support consumers, to alleviate the invoices that consumers pay this winter. And also some proposals for to reduce demand as yes, well. Yes, of course, that's important. Yeah. That's Between course. now and what is it, March or March next year at least, or? Yes, well, when, um, when, the, when, the, um, uh, when there was an earthquake in Japan and uh, the Fukushima, um, disaster happened, Japan closed all their nuclear power plants. And uh, there was a movement in Japan at the time. They saved 15% of electricity over that year because everyone had chipped in. And that's, of course, the same bit. We are a bit in a similar situation in Europe. We have, we have secured um, very high amounts of, of gas into our reserves to be prepared for winter. Yes, part but of it is, yeah, is this, isn't it? Stor yes, is yes. The storage, yeah. But of course, uh, there is a there is a need to, to to stop wasting energy. That's clear. So each everyone needs to chip in, and the kind of movement we have seen in Japan it's something which we probably would like to see in Europe as well. Yeah. But okay. what the EU has done is to agree with member states that we will reduce our demand uh, this year, of course, to reduce the pressure on our gas reserves during winter, and uh, this type of plans that member states have you know, how you manage your demand in case of scarcity. They exist. There are some elements which are more n automatic, you know, some certain industries mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. are maybe less yeah. essential will be turned off and so on. But at the same time, we need to keep our industries going. So I think there is a need for each of each single one of us to do our bit and to reduce the pressure on the system. Yeah, so I was joking, we're joking about it. For example, now we are still in September. I don't hate. We are sitting at home, it's a bit cold, but we are hoping, f we are waiting for October to start because our reserves, our winter season starts in October. So everyone who is heating now in September is reducing our reserves for the winter. I'm <laughs> just, to be perfectly frank, I'm just wearing my dog all the time. <laughs> with my dog, wearing my dog. My border collie is in high demand. I'm only bringing some lightness into what is a, absolutely a very serious topic. But um, I mean, just to pick up on, on a couple of points, we, we have 10 minutes, just to pick up on a couple of points. You said, obviously, you know, Katrina, uh, you know, we've, s you, I think you used the words, we've sped up the European Green Deal. You know, there are various mechanisms in place to, to acceler accelerate, you know, the rollout, well, not just the rollout, but, but, you know, the research and development in terms of renewables, the rollout and so on. Um, so here we are, we're trying to keep also the green transition in the tops of people's minds. But, wow, how, how ready do you think? I mean, you said that it will make sense to them to think about their usage and if we think about retrofitting houses and energy efficiency how ready do you think they might be to make that move okay i'll a heat pump or a solar panel or a, are they just going to think oh phew, forget it you know i don't even know if i can pay for what's there um well it's clear that uh, people need help yeah and um the help comes from a lot of corners, including the consumer organizations that are helping consumers understand the situation and helping them to find support that they need. Mm -hmm. It's clear that we cannot expect people to invest um, in, in a heat pump um, just like that because it costs a lot of money. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of public support available uh, and uh, this is usually means tested. So people with low income might be eligible for 100% subsidy mm -hmm. yep. 
whereas people with medium income might be eligible for 50% subsidy and people with high income might not be eligible for any subsidy. But this type of schemes we are uh, seeing across the EU, either su subsidized by the EU, subsidized by member states, um, rolled, rolled out by the municipalities, by energy agencies. Um, um, so this is, of course, needed in the short term. Yeah. Um, and I forgot the question. Yeah, <laughs> I was just saying, how can you get people to sort of keep keep that in mind? OK, you know, the sustainability journey. I could look at putting this. Can I really put a heat pump? Can I really put a solar panel? But you were talking about and mm. since this is for Euro consumers, you did say that consumer organizations do have a very yeah. important role to play in all of that. You talked about what consumers themselves. You said it's a collective effort in terms of reducing demand. But you see consumer organizations having a very specific place in this whole conversation when people yeah, are course, very yeah. scared? Of course, yeah. I mean, people um, um, have a tendency to turn to those whom they trust, right? Um, so people will turn to consumer organizations. They will also turn to their local municipality very often. Um, uh, we have a network of energy agencies across the EU who are visiting people's houses and helping them identify easy ways to save energy but also more difficult, more costly ways to save the energy and that they direct them to those who can help them put these measures in place. So I think it is op absolutely a collective effort with consumer organizations playing a, a very crucial role. Mm -hmm. uh, consumer organizations also help co uh, consumers, for example, to get uh, some of these investments at lower prices right. because you, you do the collective um, acquisitions which schemes, we heard about in our first which session. is very useful, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. And still, consumers can get additional subsidies uh, from the public sector to, to finance these type of investments. Um, so I believe that everyone who, who kind of watches what's going on uh, I mean, can you bet on uh, continue living the way we've been living, dependent on external supplies of our energy? Or maybe it's a moment to try to, to see how we could do things differently, how we could reduce our ne energy needs and maybe produce energy ourselves mm -hmm. in the local community, either people individually because they put solar panels on the roof or because we could join an energy community in our neighborhood yeah i think it, i think it's important it's 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 very valuable what you've said in terms of you know un unpacking a little bit what options there are yes. for people yes. to jump on this well the train's been left the station a long long time ago but to jump on this journey of you know right where's my energy coming from how can i you said use it better um and my question was gosh is it going to sort of turn people off it but 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 actually what we're saying is no there are all sorts of different options out mm. there. There is support out there. There is information out there. There is a way to actually use that and be on this journey to, to good effect, actually, to help yes. us get through this and out of it and build something different. As you say, you don't want to be in the same position building another bazillion pipelines, <laughs> making those agreements with, uh, with Russia. <laughs> um, so I, I think um, we did have, I hope we did have, we had, we had harvested, we were just seeing if there are a few questions and I think we've got one for you. I'm just going to see if it's coming up on screen um, because it's, as far as I know, it's a critical one with all these measures. There you go. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very straightforward one, very blunt. Will I be able to pay my bill this winter? <laughs> um, well, it depends how high is your bill. And I would say it depends whether uh, your government is going to help you. Uh, I think uh, in many countries, uh, people will face impossible bills this winter, or people risk facing impossible bills this winter. And I think uh, governments will have to support uh, their consumers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and but that of course, that's not a solution forever. Governments cannot be sub subsidizing people's energy bills forever. That's why we need to change the way we produce and consume energy. But in the very short term, meaning this winter, uh, p many people will need support from the governments. And do you have, do you sort of go to bed at tonight before tomorrow feeling hopeful or of what might come out of tomorrow? Well, uh, member states are perfectly able uh, to, um, well, perfectly able, within the fiscal space that public budgets allow. And of course, member states have been supporting uh, businesses during the COVID crisis, supporting uh, workers during the COVID crisis. So 
member states' public budgets are um, you know, not unlimited, of course, uh, but member states, uh, when the EU is trying to help with uh, helping member states create additional revenues, which can be channeled as the support, um, but even without that, governments are able to support their citizens. Yeah, you don't need um, additional, I don't know, 150 billion from the EU to do that. Uh, so in that context, to, to it is what we are going to uh, member states hopefully will agree tomorrow is additional sources of revenues for public budgets to top up the amounts that ha governments have available to support their consumers. Okay. Yeah, um, to support consumers in need. I mean, I think also. Again, it's up to member states, but we should avoid that members, uh, member states give handouts to everyone uh, who, you know, it, it needs to be linked to the energy bill. It needs to be, uh, the Commission is also um, inviting member states uh, to make sure that we still keep an incentive to reduce demand. So if, reduce demand, reduce if governments demand. decide to completely pay all the bills or you know, p people might think that we are not living in an energy crisis. We are living in an energy crisis. Okay. But it's clear that many people need support and the support needs to be adequate uh, to the needs. And, and um, yeah. Okay. So again, a very delicate, a very delicate balance. And just in the last, literally just one minute. So you just said this is what member states, this is where we, we, we would hope that they step up. This is what we require from them in this collective effort if you had to define in a couple of sentences what the EU, EU's specific role in this is alongside them, what would it be then? Well, the role of the EU is to enable member states have all the necessary tools at their disposal. So um, that's what we do. For example, we have certain limitations in existing legislation on who can, who can be eligible for a regulated price. Mm -hmm. as a consumer. So we have relaxed these rules. So, so the EU provides the enabling framework within which member states act. We also protect the internal market, of course. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that member states don't take measures which would have impact on the rest of the EU. Yeah, and then uh, they are very strong on the more medium term. So um, financing for energy efficiency and renewables, deployment of renewables, very often comes from the EU budget. Mm -hmm. So if you are eligible for a local um, municipality support for your building renovation, very likely that this is EU money. Right. Yeah, so that's, I think, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I've exhausted uh, <laughs> your time and, and I do thank you very much for your candor. I mean, I think you have been very candid on, on, on many points and um, very comprehensive in your answers. So a really appreciate you having taken the time to be with us especially as i said at the outset what is on this uh, what is on this lady's plate at the moment so thank you so very much um adela tesarova uh, it's been an absolute pleasure thank, thank you. you thank, thank you. you and so uh time time is uh time is moving on and we are shortly approaching you know the sort of the fizzing part of this event when we're going to hit the awards themselves that moment of truth when we reveal the winners of the fourth edition of the Bext euro consumers brands awards but of course who else is in the running let's have a look at the nominees in the third category which is of course reliability So as I said, we uh, cannot possibly chat about current consumer concerns, and we've just dealt with one whopping one, which is energy, and ignore the big I, inflation and rising prices, not least in our supermarkets. That is the topic on the table of our third and final session. Now, here to unpack what is undoubtedly an issue of concern, I think for all of you who are watching from your homes or offices, are two fabulous speakers. On my left, I have from Test Asha, spokesperson, public affairs and media relations, Julie Frere. Very Hello, lovely. Virginia. It's very lovely to meet you. I met you online you. before <laughs> and I haven't met you yet, but very lovely to meet you. On my right, I have CEO of food retailer, 
retailer magazine, online food retailer magazine. Online and offline. And both. offline. Both, yes. Will long be, do you think, will stay offline? Yes, for a long absolutely. time, yeah? yeah. Okay, we online. We chat during uh, one hour about the discussion, this kind of discussion, but we will stay in both, you will and offline. You will stay in both. So, of course, this is a gentleman called Pierre-Alexandre Billier. Um, he is the CEO of the food retailer magazine Gondola. I love that. Such a lot. Why, why Gondola? Well, um, the etymology is French because Gondola is the death of Gondole. It's uh, a wreck in a supermarket, and ah. that was a reason, but a long time ago, 20 years ago, so. Okay, before you were born, right? Yeah, yeah. Almost. I'm always being <laughs> so Something charming. Like this, yes. I'm always being charming with my, with my speakers. Okay, first of all, I'm gonna give you a chance to super briefly, I'm going to give these lovely people a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, just a couple of words about yourself, Julie, first of all, thank you. So hi everybody, I'm Julie Frère, as you stated, from Testacha. My, my official title is Domain Head Communication and Public Affairs, so I mostly uh, deal with the request from the French-speaking press uh, here in, uh, in Belgium. Um, I specialize in, uh, in uh, food and health uh, topics at Testacha, but given the actual uh, circumstances, I deal with energy prices every day as well, and of course inflation in, in the supermarkets as well. Uh, before that, I have been a lawyer at the Brussels bars for uh, for four years and it's going to be almost uh, nine year in, in January I will celebrate nine years at uh, Testesha. Okay thank you very much. Now before I come to our other gentlemen I believe we thought this would probably be quite a good place since you are from Testesha to show we've got a lovely headline video for this session so we're going to show that first and then I'm going to turn to our second special guest and ask him to introduce himself but video first please. Price inflation hits records across the Eurozone. As prices from food to medicines rise, we at Euroconsumers work hard to provide consumers with relevant and accurate information about prices, how to maintain their purchasing power as much as possible, and how to avoid longer-term problems. Euroconsumers members provide powerful comparison shopping engines, allowing consumers to save on price and double down on quality. These simulators are constantly updated with current online prices. In Belgium, for example, we can show you the cheapest supermarket in your neighborhood. You can compare baskets with different kinds of products, such as brands or house brands, or fresh products or not. There's also a set of online tools giving you consumer insights on a range of supermarket product categories, with the ability to compare price and quality between products. We compare 3,000 products each month in seven different supermarkets with the goal to evaluate the inflation. In Portugal, a vast supermarket comparison engine is helping consumers decide where to get the best online deals. Each day, prices are collected for 226 products across several categories, including food and beverage, house care, and personal care. With just a few clicks, consumers can find the cheapest online supermarket in their region for a whole shopping basket or just a specific product category. Your consumers provide detailed information on how to save money in all the countries where we are active. And as long as the high inflation hits consumers so hard, Euro consumers will remain extremely vigilant in analyzing its impact on products and services and giving consumers practical and direct support, and as such, giving confidence to consumers for the future. Euro consumers, finding the best deals. And don't worry, we're going to unpack a little bit more, at least I'm not, but Julie Frey is going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of those tools later on. But first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Pierre-Alexandre Billier to introduce himself. Now, I think in this market, and maybe in many others, you will already be well known, but uh, please give me that uh, quick elevator pitch intro on your good self. Okay, well, thanks for having me. So uh, my name is Pierre-Alexandre Billier. I'm CEO of Gondola, which is a retail and consumer goods platform, the professional site, so not yes. a consumer site. So yeah. we have a uh, market data market analysis we organize uh, events for decision makers decision takers we do a lot of consulting towards retail suppliers because our miss mission is to bring the actual consumer society to the new consumption we believe that the dynamics of sustainability local health and so forth need to be included in the consumption offered 
offer and not ex negative yes. externality. So we think this is a responsibility the retail and consumer business has to take and we try to help in that way. I'm also ambassador at WWF and okay. I'm a professor at the Solve Business School, which is a, okay. a local business school in Brussels. And how did you come to be ambassador at WWF? <laughs> well, you have to ask the question to them because they choose uh, different people to uh, and uh, I was very honored because I believe WWF has a very important mission. And today it's really merging with the commercial mission yes. of Gondola because we believe that consumption will be the new driver of this new society. You know, private consumption occurs for more than 51% of the GDP in Belgium. In the United States, it's more than 70%. So right. private consumption has an ecological impact, an economical impact, but also a social impact. And this is what we are living through right now, is a social, economical, right. ethical impact. Indeed, indeed. Um, and very interesting, because some years ago here, it seemed to be that sort of the economic, the environmental and social seemed to be very, very Brussels bubble. But uh, it, is, it, it really has gone out there in a, in a much more significant way. Thank you. So I'm going to quiz both of you. I'm going to um, start uh, with you. So the concept which I merely touched upon at the outset, um, I'm going to ask you if you could just, you know, ex expand a little bit on that so that we can set the scene a bit more for our audience and the context. Yes, so no problem, Katrina. So the, the situation in Belgium is quite <laughs> preoccupying. We have received uh, this morning the new uh, numbers regarding the level of inflation, uh, and it uh, actually now amounts to more than 11%. So we were at uh, a bit uh, less than 10 in August. We are now at more than 11% in September. So it's the highest level since August 1975. To give you uh, an idea, in France, uh, for the month of August, it was a bit less than 6%, 5.9%, so a huge difference between uh, France and, and Belgium. So, of course, this high inflation is caused by what you've ju discussed just before in the previous panel. It's high energy prices, very high energy prices. They actually now uh, have an inflation rate of more than 60% uh, in, in Belgium. Just to give you, again, a very concrete example, the, the average price today for an energy contract in Belgium is 6,000 euro, 6, euros a year. But it's not uncommon to find contracts uh, up to 9,000, 10,000 euros a year. So it's become really unaffordable for, for a lot of uh, uh, households. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, uh, unfortunately, uh, the inflation for food products also has uh, increased sharply. So we are now at more than 10% mm -hmm. in Belgium, 10.4 uh, uh, to be precise this, uh, this month. So this, these are the uh, official numbers. But as you have uh, said, and as we saw in the video, we also collect uh, the price for uh, 3,000 products. And uh, if, we based, uh, if we base ourselves on this basket, we can see that there is a price increase since last year of more than 13%. With some products really oh. impressive, if you take, for example, mustard, uh, it's almost 40% increase, spaghetti as well, uh, paper goods, um, Frying oils, all of these are very basic consumption goods and, and they know a very high uh, level of inflation. So, of course, in this context, I think all Belgian households are trying to find way, mm -hmm. uh, a way to save on their different bills and including on their supermarket bill. I think it's interesting to know that uh, if we if we look at the last figures available, um, the Belgian household spent more or less 16% of their total budget for, uh, for food. Okay, thank you. And I thought you were going to show some slides, and if you were, forgive me. Even though I thought you I explained was, but I was so concentrated you know, in explaining no, it to you that I, I didn't you. even uh, check if the slides uh, <laughs> were shown it, or it not. It was absolute clarity and, and absolute, um, well, I say sobering clarity. Sobering, well, I know it, but <laughs> sobering when you actually talk about the increase in the price of mustard, let's put it that way. Now, <laughs> in the light of these challenges, and it's important because already supermarkets have a lot going on, as you said. I mean, you are working with them in a very integrated way and their responsibility extends into a responsibility already on the environment and wow, there's already a lot going on. And then wham, we have these rocketing prices. They tread difficult, you know, they have a tricky role. You know, they've got producers there, they've got companies. So what's the reality for the supermarkets? There are different dimensions in, in the spectrum of reality. There is an economical reality on the short term. On the short term, most of the com those companies are stock listed. So they have a huge problem 
towards the different stakeholders, their investors, but also their economical model. It, it just does not work in this kind of context. It's not working because they lose money every day. We expect, we have an estimate that one third of the Belgian retailers operate today with a negative operating margin. Right. So that has never been the case, one third of the Belgian right. supermarkets. So th th that's huge. That means that we have a, a structural problem, mm -hmm. not only an economical model, but it will translate into probably also a social model. There has been spoken of 40% uh, of the Belgian consumers that will be living beneath a level of poverty in the months to come. So that's a little bit the danger is that, you know, as long as it's an economical problem, we can solve it with economical tools. But the real danger is that it becomes a social problem. Mm -hmm. And then the goal of that all is that we tend to forget that there are long term uh, projects like sustainability, health and, s and so on. And I think that would be the major danger today because we, can't we tend to forget that after the short term, there will be a long term and that's what we are all fighting for from the next generations and to make it better. And today that is the real problem because consumers are focused on the short term, yes. businesses are focused on the short term because that's how they work. They're stock listed and so on. They have quarterly reports and everybody is focusing on the short term. So everybody is collectively forgetting the long term. But that's what it's really about because if we as consumers or industrials or retailers, if we solve the problem on the short term and I think we will be able to solve it one way or the other, nobody knows how but let's be let's thank trust you, thank you nobody knows how i like that i like <laughs> sleeping it. yeah no, but, but, but we, we, will, we will we have to we have to yeah. we, we have yeah. to one way or the other yeah but after the short term if we just tend to forget the, the long term this will be yeah. the real problem so the real problem we, we feel it created. right now yeah but but, but it, it's the invisible part of the long term that's that's a real issue really yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let me go back. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for that, for, that, for that very good point, because I think, as you say, one is. One is head down, you know, tunnel vision, mm -hmm. and that's what one is. Absolutely. And, and you're not, you know, it's not something that's necessarily a conversation in the public domain, the issues that you have just said in the wider repercussions that we will have to deal with. I mean, let's just look again. Um, you gave, you know, brilliant. Hey, you're from Testasha, so I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. You give brilliant statistics and very sobering, as I said. Um, a little bit more on how consumers consumers are dealing with mm -hmm. this, you know, in terms of, you know, what are households experiencing? Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of behavioral change, you know? This is what we wanted to check. So we, we, we launched a survey uh, already uh, in April 2022 to ask consumers very concretely if they had uh, changed their uh, behaviors, their, their habits, mm -hmm. uh, in order to face the increasing prices. And it was in April. So since then, <laughs> prices have uh, risen, uh, as we have said. So. Overall, the results show that a large proportion of uh, households have adapted their, their behavior. If you look at, um, and I think I have a slide here, so if uh, this time <laughs> we can show it, it yeah. would be useful. Um, we have 78% of the consumers that, who have changed their behavior concerning home energy and water. So for example, turning down uh, the heating, rationing uh, water use, postponing uh, needed renovation in the house, for example. 67% uh, changed their habits with regard to mobility, so using less their car, walk or cycle more, use public transport, uh, drive a bit more eco in a more eco-friendly way. And as you can see, 64% uh, already had adapted their um, uh, food habits. Um, what we saw as well is that for all these topics, the lower income households have been hit the hardest, because if you look at uh, food habits it's 64 percent general but if you look at the lower income it's 81 percent who have adapted their uh, behavior already in april and in april the inflate the food inflation was 5.5 percent now as we said it's more than than 10. and what do we mean by food habits we mean by uh, buying cheaper brands so house brands or first price uh, products uh, buying less meat or fish uh, cutting on non-essential food. So all of these uh, habits already had been changed in April 2022. I think uh, it would be even worse if I may say it like, like this in, in, uh, in September. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, your, as you say, your, your big work and, and, and the ma is with the retailers. So what are the retailers seeing? What, I mean, does that obviously resonate with you? What else? 
a retailer seeing in terms of changing consumer behavior or adaptation? I, I think there are two major factors. Is first of all, we see the mass movements towards cheaper food and so on. Mm -hmm. So foods is the parameter of adaptation. Well, in fact, food is a primary need. So mm -hmm. we see that this whole consumption pyramid has been completely distortioned. So that, that's the first thing. Can I just to ask you to be clar to, for me, for clarity, when you say cheaper food, do you don't mean necessarily own brands. You mean leaving out some things like meat and we fish. Is we that we see we see leaving out some products. Right. And second one, we see private labels, but also first price products, the very cheap products, okay. you know, okay. the commodity products, yep. Yep. sugar, yep. water, milk yep. and so on. Okay. So on almost commodities yeah so that's the first thing so it's not only between brands own brands private label it's a real shift towards cheap products that's something we saw the first time during the mm -hmm. pandemic but then it's really collapsed bec because people were looking to compensation consumption and there was an uplift towards more quality uh, funny products and so on so we saw it br briefly, briefly during this, this first yeah. uh, period but what we see right now and that's really new is the speed of change i mean it took decennia it took tens 20, 30 years to change habits from consumers and retailers have never been able to bring consumers towards a more sustainable consumption. It was really difficult. Nobody wanted to pay for this added value because it was not tangible. But what we see right now is a speed of change and that's completely new because consumers are adapting in a couple of days, completely changing and right. adapting their consumption. And so the role of the media is really, really important today. We saw it first time with a huge race towards uh, toilet paper and so on in Belgium. I guess race it was towards toilet paper. That's yeah, yeah. Like I mean, the it was the toilet paper race. Yeah, yeah, it needs its own Olympic category. Yes, yes, but indeed, indeed. So yeah. it's so the speed and the impact. Yeah. That's the two two new parameters that retailers are facing today. Okay, so that so so in that sense, there is there is there is good to come out. There is it, it's forcing the shift, as we were talking about in terms of perhaps energy use and forcing people to think. That's that, that's a really good point because potentially it's forcing the shift now. Nowadays, the sh the shift is going down mm -hmm. to, which it's a downsizing to less quality products, l lower prices, but it means that there is potentially a speed yes, towards change. Uh, yeah, Today the indeed. speed is downwards, yeah, but it could also but be upwards be, yeah. if there are the right incentives. And then we made mm -hmm. the link towards po uh, politics. If they can make the right incentives, people are really willing to change nowadays. Mm -hmm. So that's really new compared to the previous uh, years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, so um, this, this changing relationship, I mean, just because I think to bring those consumers and retailers even more together, of course, there's producers in the mix, but um, perhaps you could give us a couple of examples of, of, of marketing campaigns mm -hmm. in this kind of very rapidly changing climate. Um, as we, as uh, Pierre Alexandre just said, of course now price is the main focus. Uh, so all the the supermarkets are competing with each other with purchasing power act actions. So if you take, for example, the three uh, uh, biggest player, uh, Carrefour uh, promised a thousand products uh, at less than one euros. Uh, they blocked uh, the price of a hundred products for a hundred days. Uh, Deleuze, another big player, for example. Um, uh, promoted reductions on its own brands, a bit more than 400 uh, products of its own uh, brands. Uh, Colreuth, who is also well known in Belgium for really a price positioning, uh, uh, promoted his brand festival also with uh, a bit more than 100 brands, uh, 1,500 products uh, with a uh, reduction. But then you have to buy more to get the, the reduction. But So you see that there, there are all these uh, actions really focused on, on, on the price. Uh, well, as you know, us, uh, we've also played our role of uh, watchdog. So we've also seen that the these actions were not always as transparent and as uh, interesting for the consumer as they presented themselves. Um, and something else that we see is a phenomenon called shrinkflation, where you see the the quantity uh, in the same pa the packaging does not change, but they diminish oh the yes. quantity of the of the product. Yeah. And this is for us a very uh, pernicious way to 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 increase the price in reality because consumers don't really notice uh, the price increase so yes so still in those times even with the very sometimes interesting purchasing actions you still need to be careful as a consumer okay thank you so I, I mean it's obvious to come back you know I said at the outset it's a complex role um, retailers are 
coming to the consumers, but also not always transparently. So um, what do you think? I mean, their responsibility needs to be there. How, how does that how does that resonate with you, what you just heard there? About which part? The about the part about about you know yes there is those offerings yes that's what 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 retailers are doing, um, sometimes not entirely transparently. The shrinkflation is a very good example, and obviously we have it in other sectors and we have it in restaurants and all sorts. Um, so so sort of that side of things, I'm curious to hear to hear your your response to that. But also in terms of consumers and scarcity you called it the you know the olympic toilet i called it the olympic toilet roll um things aren't always on shelves is it because it's a very tricky relationship with certain producers that retailers have or is it because of supply chain issues which have been going on for some time mm -hmm. you know even during covid so i'm asking you two separate things yeah, that's, firstly that's, that's, what's that's that sort of and then <laughs> and then and then sort of a little bit more about the retailer role but first of all this shrinkflation and are they being entirely transparent with us well the thing is that they, they can't be entirely transparent because there is no transparency in the whole value chain. So it's t totally impossible. That's how some businesses, the low end retail developed its business model. So there is no transparency in the whole value chain. So we cannot expect from retailers and I'm not defending retailers. I'm just explaining how it works. You cannot expect from the last part of the chain to be transparent if the first uh, 60 or 70 percent of the chain isn't. So that's the first technical problem. The second one is it's becoming a legal pro problem because in Belgium, producers or retailers are not allowed to sell with loss. So that's simply not allowed in Belgium. Mm -hmm. And there is one exception if they are following or adjusting into the market, then they have the, the possibility to sell with loss. And we estimated that about one third of the retailers are selling with loss today. So that's another reason why they can't be transparent. So it's technical, but there's also a legal aspect. And so that's why I say that this is really a crisis is because, you know, the etymology of the word crisis is choosing in Greek yes. and they will have to choose one way or the other. But the only way is up. Food has never been so cheap as today, never been since 1850. So we're we worked on those those uh, those figures since 1850. Food has never been as cheap. So I mean, the only way is up. But the question is how today with the purchasing power. So that that's the first question. And first then answer to your question. Thank <laughs> you. And did you want to come in just before? No, no, I, uh, no, no. Um, and, and the other one was more. Um, Yes, about it was just to get a, a more view of, you know, there is a lot, certainly in the mm -hmm. UK, there is a lot of talk yes, yes. of empty shelves and a lot of it was, you know, post-Brexit as well at the start, although that's slightly a omerta word, <laughs> but um, uh, what is the reason or is it, you know, we, we have heard stories where, you know, with producers and retailers, it's just too complicated because a producer can't lower a price and then the goods don't end up on the shelves. So well, in the past, we had a, almost a zero sum game and that was OK for all those companies because, you know, they worked with small margins, but it's OK. But now we have a zero negative sum game and that's a real problem for both suppliers and retailers. And what is the reason? First of all, in Belgium, we lost 85 percent of the agricultures between 1980 and today. So there are only 15% of agricultures left. So of we have agricultural. Yeah, agriculture. The guy, yeah, the guy on the land uh, working. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. So the, the still there is a production issue. So production has been outsourced to other countries, sometimes out of Europe and so on. So food is ex extremely cheap. That's the first thing, due history. So this is historical data. The second one is there is a problem on the supply, but there's also a problem on the demand. We saw that the demand, both in volume and in value, is going down. So retailers and big food industrialists are oh. stuck just in the middle because there is a, a problem of supply. Mm -hmm. We saw it also. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been enhanced during the crisis, you know, the palm oil uh, the kinds mm -hmm. of uh, vegetables mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on, the crisis in Ukraine. But it's also the demand and they're just stuck in between. And that's why there is a crisis. It's not because prices are only low. It's because there are high fluctuations. And that's something that, you know, food retail and retail is what we call a defensive industry. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a defensive industry anymore. Today, the local hero, Colrad, went 20% down on the stock market mm -hmm. because they announced very difficult figures. So that's the reality nowadays. We've never, never experienced that in history. 20% down, that's, that's completely new. Mm -hmm. But that's a reality as we speak right now. Okay. Thank you. We have five minutes left with both of you. So let's just go back and, and, and just to make sure we've sort of um, 
you know, tied off. I mean, we could have tied off many other corners, but at least just for, for, the, for, for the conversation we've had, what do the consumers want from the retailer? What do mm -hmm. they expect? So we've heard, you know, the rock bottom prices just, you know, it's, it's sort of like a commodities market there in the supermarket. But what do consumers mm -hmm. want? What do consumers also need if we are to keep the retailers on track to to uh, play a different role than they have traditionally in the way you explained, to take that wider responsibility, to be part of that bigger journey. What, what information do I think do what need? consumers need is actually quite simple. <laughs> they need to be correctly informed. They need to be correctly informed about the price, about the quality, about the, the sustainability of what they, they buy. So they need to understand what they see, to trust what they see, and they, they need to, to be able to make a very quick decision. We know it's when you're at the supermarket and you buy something, you make your decision in less than 30 seconds. So you need to see all the right and correct information in a transparent and, and intelligible way on the packaging. And I think manufacturing Manufacturers, producers understood this, and this is also why we see now uh, a label just such as NutriScore, which is a very good thing, as EcoScore as well. So they've understood that there is a demand, even though uh, we are, we, we said it, we are now in a very difficult context. So uh, people are more attentive to, to the price criterion. Than some of this. Yeah, uh, actually in Belgium, I, and I think uh, Pierre Alexandre al also said it, but we've seen, and it's not the same in all European countries, but in Belgium, the, the, the price remains like the first criteria uh, w when uh, you make a, a purchasing decision with regard to food. And it's before origin, it's before nutrition quality, right. and, uh, and it's before uh, your ethics, for example, sustainability uh, or, or, or anything else. So in the context that we've now described, um, the criterion, the price criterion, uh, will become even more important. But that that doesn't take away that uh, retailers ha also have an, uh, a responsibility in informing consumers correctly. There are also consumers who are not suffering from the crisis that we are uh, we are um, going through now. So this long-term solutions, as uh, mentioned by uh, Pierre Alexandre, should be not be forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I'm going to pick up, um, as I said, there are um, some ticker tape. We've got some questions that have come in. We harvested a couple of questions from audience before this. Now, I think you touched on the first one. If we can show the first one, because you, you actually, I think in your first answer already, touched upon an answer. Do you have confidence in the current business model should the role of the retailer change? Now, if I recall right at the outset, you said, yeah, the way it works is not you're trying to get a greater engagement with the consumer and a greater engagement in some of these critical mm -hmm. issues. So did I understand the role should yeah. change? Yeah, so, so, so indeed, um, the word trust is very important. I think what everybody needs today is trust. So not solving one problem and then another and then another. So I have trust in parts of the system, yes, because we have been able to feed the whole world. Uh, today we are eight, eight billion people. Mm -hmm and the land is uh, almost stable. So w there has been a huge production of food, quality food. So f some things work, but I don't trust in how the system works nowadays. But there are things that are fantastic. The supply chain model is quite interesting. We're able to feed a lot of people with quality food, the production, but it's not the way it will work tomorrow. So I trust in the system today, but that's not an answer to tomorrow. And we so no if you have to say in very briefly, so that shift for you, if you have to it's articulate it. It's very easy. I will, I'll explain in 30 seconds. Not too fast, though. You're a faster speaker than me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That's what I'm excited. No, I told Julie. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the thing is, is the main subject is the negative externalities. Um, food, and, and it, it's been proven, there's uh, academic studies, and also from the United Nations, is uh, there is for every one euro in food, one euro of negative externalities. And that's a huge accelerator, a huge value creator that we need to use, we need to improve, because today it's negative externalities, 50% yes. is negative externalities on the ecosystem, 30% on the health of consumers and 20% on the economy. So there's huge room for improvement. That's the good news. So today it's more a liability than it's negative uh, externalities, but we can turn it into an asset. 
It's really an engagement that we need. And the word trust was very well chosen. We need to engage with this trust. That's how we're going to bring value. It's not by selling more diapers or more uh, toilet paper or more mm -hmm. apples or fruit. That's not the answer. But a lot of those retailers are focused on both volume and value is not their strength. But this is where we can create a lot of value for the consumer, but also for the society, because our health system is just too expensive. So this is briefly <laughs> what I think we should do. Thank you. And and um, staying with you just for a last um, a question. I think we've got a last question and I'll come to you first. I think we're bringing things more down to the micro level and, and really going back to consumers and, 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 you know, how they're feeling at the moment. What three tips or pieces of advice do you have for me as a consumer in response to these rising prices? We talked about behavior change. We talked about the need for information, for transparency, for trust, um, own brands, all sorts of things, leaving things out that are expensive. Anything we missed? Anything else that you would? Yeah, I, I think the what we missed is the consumer behavior parts. Uh, two of the last uh, Nobel Prizes in economics, Richard Taylor and Daniel Kahneman, just focused on that, the consumer behavior parts. So it's not only about the purchasing power, it's about the perception of the consumer in purchasing power. Just two things. I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, you've got that. So, yep, yeah, you're okay. You've got one minute and then I come to you. One thing. But don't speed up, because otherwise <laughs> they'll miss it. All of these lovely people will miss it. Go on. Okay. <laughs> so. so the first so thing is what we call loss aversion is if governments want to compensate the loss in purchasing power, they will have to double the loss in purchasing power because the consumer experiences mm. the loss in purchasing power or the loss in general twice as hard as when he wins something. If I okay. win one euro, right. I experience I win one euro. If I lose one euro, I experience like okay. if it's two, two euros. euros. That's so that's thing. the perception side. That's perception. Things. But it yeah. has an economic... Uh, a fallout, a repercussion, repercussion yeah, impact. Indeed, yeah. indeed, that's the first thing. And the second thing is about 95% of the products that we buy as a consumer in supermarkets are high or low impulsive products. Mm -hmm. I mean, the real needed products, it's about 5 or 6% yes, of products sold yeah. in the supermarket. Mm. So, I mean, consumer can behave in another way yes. and can have an a, a different consumer uh, if you uh, prepare your purchases or if you make a list, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that's this can have an impact on 95% of the things you buy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the commodities, yeah. food, sugar, uh, water, mm -hmm. uh, eggs and so on, it's about 5 or 6% okay. of items sold in a supermarket. Indeed. So that's a great enhancer that we have to optimize the purchasing power. Mm -hmm. I always think it's also good to think just at the, t the, the, not the time of day you do it, I don't mean in the actual clock time of day, I mean how you are when you go if shopping you're hungry, to the for extent, yes. or you're pissed off, all or comes you're back. I will just mm. buy a vat load Absolutely. of Belgian yeah. chocolate, I'm pissed yeah. off, that's it what all I'm comes do. back. It all comes back to this 95% this, yeah. of yeah. impulsive that's buying, very interesting. not uh, yeah. processed, uh, uh, or how to say, not, um, uh, I'm prepared to buy. Yeah, them. not yeah. the prepared and the considered. Yeah. yeah. Considered. The okay. considered buy. Okay, last for you. I mean, obviously, Testasha, you know, consumer organizations are doing a lot. You mm -hmm. said that. There's the tools. You're keeping an eye. Yes. You notice things. You're informing consumers mm -hmm. so that they can keep an eye. Mm -hmm. You are asking, you know, we really need to keep on this, this long term, that information. Okay, at the moment it might be priced, but we need to make sure that information consumers is still going to be there. Uh, what what three tips or pieces of advice would you? But give? I was I was thinking very very concrete tips. I yeah. totally agree with the one uh, Pierre Alexandre said, like to make a, a list and, and not to uh, to avoid impulsive uh, of uh, compulsive uh, uh, buying. Always compare the price per unity, as we said, you avoid yes. shrinkflation, you avoid mm -hmm. the maxi packs that are actually not <laughs> sometimes m less interested than the, the smaller uh, formats. Uh, we haven't said it, but uh, house brands are 51% cheaper than, than uh, national brands, yeah. and they are of good quality, so this is also a way to save on and your bill. And you can And you can use the Nutri-Score also to have uh, insights on quality, yeah. and of course, as we have, we, as 
we've mentioned, I also recommend using our tool, of course, to, to find the che cheapest supermarket uh, in your neighborhood. That's but a very it, concrete but tip. <laughs> no, thank you so very much. And just saying again, it's all about perception, even own brands. It's about changing. It's about questioning your perception of things, I think, as well. Um, OK, you've been absolutely fabulous. I think we're on time for, um, for our speakers. So really warm thanks, warm thanks. I'm thank looking you. at them here. But warm thanks to both of you so very much. And it's delightful that I managed to get absolutely all my speakers with me in the studio this year, which wasn't the case last year. So I think we're just about on time. Uh, we are. Stay tuned. Please don't go away, all of you lovely people, uh, because we're about to kick off the fourth edition of the Bext Euro Consumers Brands Awards. So don't go away. excited because let me tell you that presenting awards really is I promise you the best job a moderator can have um, what I would like to do at this juncture before I invite back my delightful co-presenters is to remind you of the three categories and the eight subcategories we can show all of that on one single screen And a very warm back. Look, look at me, I can't even speak now. Let me try again. A very warm welcome back to my fellow presenters. I have on my right again. No, they have not changed position. You could have been there. I guess you could have been there all the time behind the desk, <laughs> couldn't you? <laughs> Just listening in. And, and I an, was actually. Yeah, annoying. Not, you know. not really here, but. Yeah. Uh, Next. Uh, Next door. You could have been down there tugging on people's trousers and trying to <laughs> annoy them. But here we have again, in case you're joining from the first time, Rachele Colombo, who is a uh, market lead at Italian consumer organization, Altro Consumo, and the lovely, well, you're also lovely, the lovely Michele Cavuotti, who is product manager at Euro Consumers. Now, super short again, in case people are joining for the first time, and I mean 20 seconds each. Michele, what are the awards about? Your time starts now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, abort, the, the award is about to recognize the company that are uh, putting in the market very good products under three dimensions. The value for money, the uh, friendliness and the sustainability. So we want to recognize the, their capability to better serve the consumer based on our comparative test. Brilliant. <laughs> that brilliant. I really horrified you there, didn't I, when I said tw your 20 seconds <laughs> starts now. You're going, oh. Um, and again, just a reminder, finalists and winners were chosen. Consumers got to have their say. You ran bazillions of tests. Yes, both of Tell that. Us. Both of that. We have um, both results from um, tests that were conducted in uh, the best laboratories that we have in the world, actually, on products. And then we also took in, uh, into account uh, the, um, the responses uh, of uh, tens of thousands uh, of uh, European consumers. Uh, to elect uh, the best brands uh, we I have love today. That. So absolutely, incredibly evidence, evidence, evidence-based. Shall we get stuck in? Of I course. I think we should. Yes, yeah. Okay, let's off we go with our first category. The first category is, of course, value for money. And we have a first subcategory in that. Let's see what it is. So, value for money in mobile high tech. I think the obvious question to you, Raquel, is just give us a little bit of insight into what this category is all about. Yes, of course. As we said before, uh, this year we really wanted to focus uh, on um, the important aspects for consumers in this difficult time, to be yeah. honest. So, uh, we conducted an analysis both on quality, but also on uh, the level of prices of these products in stores. And we defined uh, which were the best products products uh, for uh, uh, quality uh, over price, let's say. Mm -hmm. And okay. um, then we have uh, a winner as a brand. Okay, so thank you very much, sure. leading me nicely into my next, uh, what I'm going to say next, which is, of course, can we reveal the winner? So we're going to remind ourselves of the nominees and then the winner is going to be revealed. One. 
And there we go. I feel... <laughs> I don't know how much of the audience can hear us underneath the music, but I'm going to clap. I'm going to say congratulations. We're going to have a small celebration with a glass of water in the studio. There we are. Uh, Raquel, very briefly, why this winner? Why Xiaomi? Let's say that uh, the competition was tough uh, this year, but uh, Xiaomi was uh, especially found uh, in a uh, good quality of price uh, for the category of smartphone. Uh, they really rocked that. Are they? Oh. They really rocked that. I really, really like that. Well, that's very nice. So I think we should see, uh, we should hear from uh, Xiaomi International itself because that's such a wonderful introduction. So a very warm welcome to Doris Pan, who is head of marketing Western European region at Xiaomi International. Apparently, the brand really rocked it. Now, look, I have, as if by magic, look, there. It's there. So let me give you just a moment to say, well, how do you feel about this win? Um, thanks for inviting me. So for us, it's definitely an honor to receive this award for the second year in a row. And it is yet another demonstration of how much our consumers and our fans in Spain, Italy, Belgium, and Portugal appreciate our brand and our diversified range of products. So for Xiaomi, definitely, Definitely, like value for money is certainly one of the most appreciated aspects by our users when it comes to smartphones and also other products such as wearables. And it is also oh. what motivates and encourages them to become our fans and to discover mm -hmm. many other products from our extensive ecosystem, including TVs, smart mobility, welcome cleaners, just to mention a few of them. So uh, we are working with passion and dedication to be able to offer the best innovation and uh, uh, at the best possible price to give everyone the chance to live a better life thanks to our, to our technology, uh, not only in the smartphone category, but more broadly across all our AR OT products. So I'm sure as intelligent connectivity becomes more integrated into our lives, our smartphone and AR OT core strategy will reap synergic benefits helping smartphone business expand into more application scenarios, winning the hearts of always more and more users. So for the future, we will continue to offer products with the best price to performance ratio, and we will also seek to make the coolest products. So we firmly believe that no matter what, the pursuit of technological innovations will always be the prerequisite for Xiaomi's competitiveness. Speaking of innovations, we will strive this mission and amaze our fans with more upcoming. And also, please don't forget to stay tuned on Xiaomi's next global launch in Munich next Tuesday. Thank wow, you. you. Thank you so much. You've packed in a lot of brilliant information there, not least that little nod right at the end. And thank you for we had words like fans and uh, coolest and passion and dedication. So. Um, uh, uh, obviously a very, very well-deserved win. This is coming your way. Thank you so much for being available to be with us and warm congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put that over there so I don't mix it up with all sorts of all sorts of other brilliant things I'm going to reveal shortly, but we're going to move directly on into the second subcategory. Let's have a look what that second subcategory is. So again, I'd like to turn to the lovely lady on my right and say anything to add in terms of how value for money applies, because this is obviously a very different category to the first. Yes, it's a very different category, especially the quality is assessed in different ways through the laboratories. Still, uh, the price inquiries uh, have been carried out uh, by uh, Euro consumers uh, in a similar way, focusing mm, both online and offline. Okay. And uh, since, we s as we said before, uh, the value for money is uh, super important in these times, and especially for this kind of product categories. I think, I think value for money is three words that are very... Um they're very anchored, you yeah. know, they're very anchored for people. They're, they're, they're very emotional, they're very to the point, they're, they're very critical, they're as very you now. rightly say, and they're very, very critical now. So it remains for me to ask a little reminder of who the nominees are, and then, of course, for the winner to be revealed.
I'm doing clapping. I'm doing a small amount of dancing, actually, because I feel <laughs> I would like you all to be in the party spirit because you're not with us. Uh, why Electrolux? Very solid name in the market. Why this winner? Yes, again, uh, the competition is always tough, but I have to say that uh, Electrolux was uh, uh, particularly uh, scoring high in our rankings uh, in uh, washing machine and especially in tumble dryers. So uh, we've especially found uh, uh, good uh, uh, value for money in these two categories. Okay. Thank you very much. And so here we go. I'm going to ask very shortly to join us uh, Maximilian Müller, who is Director, Corporate Communications, Sales and Services, Europe, Electrolux Business Area Europe. A very warm welcome to you. Look, da da, ba 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 ba. You can see it, you can't touch it, but you will be able to. So, uh, warm congratulations. Would you like to say a few words? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very happy and proud to receive this award by your consumer. Uh, and on behalf of the entire Electrolux team, let me pass on our big appreciation. This is uh, actually the second time in a row that uh, that we are recognized in this important category, value for money. So it means we are obviously doing something right uh, and meeting the needs of our consumers. Spending more time at home due to the coronavirus pandemic has meant that people place even more value on high quality appliances with relevant futures and uh, benefits. Greater consumer awareness and access to information on prices, offers, product characteristics and consumer reviews increasingly empower consumers and we want to be an integral part of that journey. At Electrox, we, we are on a mission uh, to reinvent taste, care and well-being experiences for more enjoyable and sustainable living around the world. And this award confirms that we are on the right track. It is both an honor and an incentive for the future. Uh, and we promise uh, that we will be back. Uh, we do our utmost uh, to retain our consumers' confidence um, and uh, return it with passion, quality and sustainable innovations also going forward. Again, thank you very much. Well, well, thank you very much, but well, well, well done. And you're absolutely right. You consumers keep you on your toes. They have to, they are more empowered. They are more wise. They are more knowledgeable. And these are critical times where they are weighing up their choices, uh, you know, much in a much more rigorous way. So indeed, you've been winners before. Huge congratulations. And I promise I won't steal that and put it in my bathroom. It's going to come to you. Okay, thank you so very much. Thank you, perfect. So I'm going to give that, I'm going to ask to, the, to, to you, you are helping me very much. If I'm handing her out, handing yeah, you can't keep it either. That's absolutely critical. So can we now move straight into the second of the awards three categories? Um, and it has three sub categories. So the category itself is eco-friendly. It's got three sub categories. Here's the first. And now I'm putting you on the spot, lovely Michele. Tell me about this category in a nutshell. Yeah. Yes, so in this, uh, with this award, we recognize the uh, brands that uh, perform well in uh, um, the resource consumption. So having Please. low consumption of electricity and water, uh -huh. it is extremely important, but at the same time, ensure good quality, good yeah. Mm, efficacy of the of the appliances. Here we are talking about large household appliances. In particular, we talk about washing machine, dishwasher, tumble dryer, and uh, uh, cold appliances. So that is the frame uh, in, in which we uh, release this uh, award. Thank you very very much. So yes, it's all very well having all of that brilliant resource friendliness if then you're not actually doing the job for the consumer, but yeah. this is what you are rewarding, those who get the whole package together. So uh, let us please, as I say, we'll get a reminder of the nominees, but let us now reveal the winner. And there we go, we have a double win. So we've got double winners, Mila and Samsung. Now I'm gonna see who can join us first, who I think we had everybody online and now we've had some drop connections. I hope, 
I hope that we have uh, Kim Taylor from Mila with us. Is that yes, we should do. Kim Taylor, who is event PR and communi communication manager from Mila uh, Bilux. He is joining us now, so we will wait for you to be able to see him. We can see him behind. There, now everyone, look. Ta -da, ta -da. I sort of feel I need to come up with a different dance every time. I'm going to do this now. Da -da, ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba. There you go. So, congratulations. Are you surprised or you think, nah, of course, we're brilliant? First of all, thank you a lot, Katrina, and thank you all for choosing Mila. We're really delighted because sustainability has always been at the heart of our DNA since our founding nearly 120. 25 years ago, and we develop every appliance to consume less water and less energy. And it's great to receive this award from consumers who recognize exactly that. They choose Miele because we make daily household chores easier and we help them to preserve the planet. i give you just a few examples. Our washing machines have a technology that detects the load automatically and adapt to water consumption and the energy consumption accordingly. Our auto-dosing system allows you to use 30% less detergent. We commercialize heat pump dryers and only heat pump dryers that consume one third of the energy of plastic dryers. And finally, more than 42% of our energy labels on our appliances are A-labels in comparison to the total market where it is only 12%. So for sure, sustainability will remain at the heart of our innovation strategy. We will continue to inspire consumers to make sustainable choices day after day. A big thank you to you all. Big thank you to you. You've certainly convinced me. I seem to be pronouncing all the, please, I said Mila, but you pronounced it differently. What did I get wrong? In Belgium, we also say Miele. Uh, depends, okay. I think, of the country. I think that in France, they pronounce it a little bit differently. Okay, so I didn't, okay, I didn't butcher the name. That's the most important thing for me. All right, well, warm, warm congratulations. Thank you for clarifying why you think you're a very, very worthy winner. And that is coming over to you very, very soon. Congratulations. Now, I'm not sure we had a joint winner, as we know, but I think, no, nope, the connection was dropped. So uh, I do have, oh, oh my God, just in the nick of time. Da, 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 da. Do we have, do we have? I think so, where I can see again, off screen, yeah. uh, on and off, on and off. So I'm holding up, we do yeah. genuinely. Yeah, there were. Yeah. T go for it. No, no, no. just to, to say that uh, yes. for delivering this award, we tested more than 1,000 products uh, in the four wow. uh, product category that, uh, that I mentioned. And so yes. that is a, a very large base for uh, releasing this award. So how long does it take to, to ah, I think we have them, but how long does it take to, to test that many? We uh, it t that is based on the test of the last two years, okay. so actually two years. Okay, all yeah. right. You did sleep, didn't you, in that time? <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> we are We are a big organization, as I said before, yeah, across you are, you different are countries. You so are a network. Yeah, exactly. So you are doing all of that. So I will just, oh, I think, my goodness, thank you for offering that little gem and helping to fill that space, because yes. look, we've got the other winners, Samsung, two people who are joining us. We've got senior technical manager, Jose Corte Real, and we've got a uh, mobile devices specialist, Arjuna Segers. So I hope, there you are. Hello, look, it's, it's here. Great. You made it. Here. Please tell me you're not frozen. Hello. Even if you are frozen, we saw you. <laughs> we saw your lovely faces. You look like you're happy to be receiving this. So, no, I think we need to move on. But listen, I'm so glad we got to see you albeit frozen, and you got to see this, and warm, warm congratulations. congratulations. Okay, trophies on the way. We know this. I'm giving it to you, please, Raquel. Yeah. And so, cracking on, the second subcategory, still with eco-friendly, is something very different, automotive tyres. Let's have a look.
So I'm going to turn to you again, Michele. You were testing yeah. something very different to uh, yeah. tumble dryers and such like here. Very different. Tell yes, me. yes, because we test a larger set of products and tires are important. Uh, is, an, is a relevant por uh, product for the consumer. It's one of the most visited uh, uh, website pages uh, uh, in... Uh, in um, by the consumer and uh, oh. uh, we awarded the, the brands in that case that uh, have the lower environmental impact yeah. considering two parameters the durability yep. of the tires and the, f the impact on fuel on consumption yeah. uh, okay. what is interesting that is both are also related not just with the environment but also with the pocket of consumer so good brands uh, uh, in that case we join uh, let me say the sustainability dimension with the economic dimension. Yes. That is uh, relevant for consumer. And just if I heard that correctly, you said it's the most visited web page for, what did you say right at the start for that, for tires? It's one of the most visited, uh, let me say, web, web, uh, web page in our, in our site. Wow. Yes. wow, yes. gosh, I don't know why that's surprising. That's, wow, interesting. Yes, because there is a season here. So when you have to change the tires, yeah. there is a lot of traffic at that moment yes. because people move from the summer tires to yes. the winter tires. And that's, that's is a, a moment, a peak uh, in, the, in our visit. You must be the best person to sit next to at a dinner party. <laughs> I swear to God, because you've got all of these interesting nuggets. OK, so I need to now ask uh, a reminder of the nominees, but of course, for the winner to be revealed. There we have it, a household name if ever there was one, I call it. That's what we say in here, a household name if ever there was one. So uh, we don't have a representative of yeah. uh, Michelin with us. Uh, we don't get to speak to a representative, but I get to speak to you. So obviously, why? Why this yeah. winner? So actually, Michelin won for the third consecutive year, um, thanks to an outstanding performance on durability. Okay. And that is the, the main reason why they, they, they won. And they are not with us today, but uh, let me say that maybe n if they won also next year, we have to go to Clermont-Ferrand in France to, uh, in order to get their, uh, <laughs> their feedback about this, uh, this award. So it's a message for them. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Anything you want to add? Oh. No, 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 I agree totally <laughs> with Michele. It's uh, an outstanding, uh, for the third time they won. Yes. So we definitely have to congratulate to Michelin. Okay, they are definitely front runners. Okay, we're going to move into that third and last uh, subcategory in this second category. I uh, hope you're all following that. Uh, let's have a look at what it is. Now on this kind of as somebody who's an obsessive cleaner, especially when I need to clear my mind, I would not accept a home detergent that wasn't eco-friendly anymore. <laughs> so personally speaking, so tell me yes, about yes. this. Yes, for sure water is more eco-friendly, but it's not washing, that's the problem. Uh, you cannot wash just with water. So um, in our mm, test, uh, uh, comparative test, we consider laundry detergent, dishwasher detergent, and bathroom detergent. And we assess the efficacy and the environmental impact. That cannot be avoided, but can be minimized, uh, ensuring the efficacy. That is the challenge, yes. eh? to balance these two, uh, these two uh, performance, let me say. Our eco score includes uh, the chemical composition yep. of the detergent yep. and the packaging. Yep. And that's uh, in this particular category, we consider uh, international group, uh, which may present multiple brands in portfolio. So okay. we, we, in that case, the brand is not related to the specific, uh, the, the brand that you found in, yes, the, in the supermarket, but to the international group that is okay. producing that. 
Okay. And by the way, when I said at the beginning I cleaned when I needed to clear my head, I didn't mean myself, I meant my house. <laughs> so, you know, and I'm always looking in that context for eco-friendly, yeah. but absolutely very delicate balance and also perhaps easier at the moment for consumers to grasp from the outside, oh, recycled packaging. You see more and more of that, but not so knowledge about, not, you know, so clear about what's on the inside and both. Yeah equally important the yes, composition sure. and that packaging okay so uh it remains again for me to ask let's have a little reminder of the nominees and find out who the winner is Well, there we go. It's a draw. Now, unfortunately, we don't have representatives of Sodalis and uh, eCover with us, but that allows me to turn back to you and to yeah. ask you that very obvious question, why that draw? I mean, we've heard from Raquel yeah. earlier that there were some real tricky ones in terms yeah. of, you know, comparisons and who you decide, and here yeah. we have a draw. So yeah, yeah, we have a draw because uh, actually Sodalis, gr Sodalis prevails in the category of dishwasher detergents, okay. while Ecovacer Eco prevailed in the category of the laundry detergents. Okay. So at the end, the two brands arrived ties as winner. And you okay. have two tied, two tied in this edition of the award. That is the reason why I wear a tie, you see. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> that is. The worst but most charming joke I've <laughs> ever heard. That is fabulous. It's a yeah. nice tie, though. Yeah, yeah. I love that joke. Yeah. Did you like that joke? Of course, you ch you did something to Michele. I don't know <laughs> what that happened. That is just <laughs> the best. Okay, it's just just fabulous. Yeah, yeah. That's why you are wearing a tie because they were t in two different, two exactly. separate categories. Yeah, they performed equally well. Yeah. Okay, okay. Is it exceptional for you to wear a tie? Yes, it is uh, for these uh, just for these circumstances. Oh my goodness <laughs> me! Well, so Dallas and eCover should feel very, very proud and more proud than the trophies that are going to be on their way to them shortly. So warm congratulations. On that note, let's move into the third and last of our three categories. This is a great one. They're all great, but we can't have a Consumer Brands Awards without having this category, reliability. I mean, what's the point in anything if it doesn't work and it doesn't deliver? There are three subcategories. Let's have a look at the first one. So I'm going to turn now again to the lovely lady on my right, Raquel. Tell me a little bit about re reliability and how it relates to mobile devices. And I'm sure consumers are obsessed with the reliability oh, of mobile <laughs> devices. They are, they are yeah. for sure. And uh, it's understandable because, uh, of course, uh, uh, we are talking about uh, mobile devices uh, mm, that we use every day and so many times during a day. So um, what we did, uh, these awards are based on the direct experience of consumers. So these are carried out by service. Okay. And um, what uh, the consumer said uh, is that uh, there was uh, uh, a different uh, amount of brands uh, that were very reliable for okay. this year. Oh, okay, a different amount of brands. Very oh, God, that's even more exciting now. So yes. let's, uh, let's remind ourselves of the nominees, but of course, directly find out who the winner is. And so, wow, among those very well-known brands, Sony is the winner. Again, unfortunately, we don't have a representative with us, uh, but I'm excited enough easily for every single brand that can't be with us to, to collect their trophy. But let me again ask you, you know, why? You said well, consumers had said, actually, there's 
quite a lot of brands of that work well. Of course, it's so an outstanding result because yeah. uh, uh, Sony is not uh, the market leader in, um, for example, no. a smartphone, yeah. but still uh, the experience that the consumers have registered is very, very high. Oh. And so this year uh, they won, especially for uh, this uh, experience they had with their smartphone. While I have to say, for example, with tablets, we had different brands uh, that were uh, up in the, in the charts. But for smartphones, they, they were a clear winner. Yes. Yeah. Okay, wow. Well, uh, congratulations. And uh, so if anybody from Sony is watching, then of course, um, the trophy will be coming your way. And now we have two uh, final subcategories before these lovely sparkling awards come to a close. So can we see what the second, the penultimate subcategory is, please? So again, we're moving from something very small to something very large. So tell <laughs> us again, reliability in this particular category. Yes, another very important category. Uh, I have to say here as well, uh, we collected uh, so many um, surveys uh, from consumers uh, and uh, we just uh, received uh, and uh, analyzed the results uh, during this summer. And uh, we will see who is the winner then. Please tell me you did not analyze results on a beach under yes, a... Yes, we do also. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Yeah. oh, well, you are very dedicated. We are. This, this we, can, we can be absolutely sure. OK, so on that note, therefore, uh, let's remind ourselves of the nominees and, of course, find out who the winner is. Well, woo-hoo. I mean, that's another win. That is absolutely stupendous. Boo-hoo-hoo, I can see. We're, go we're, go we're gonna meet our, our uh, again, uh, we're gonna meet the lovely Kim, but I can see him going, yoo-hoo-hoo, there he is behind. Uh, I'm just, uh, actually, I'll come afterwards to ask why Raquel is the winner. Let's speak to you first. Hang on, I've gotta just do this. I'm shrinking, look, I'm going down. <gasps> da -da, da -da, da -da. Just to prove, just to prove there is another one. We're not making you kind of sort of cut the other one in half. Um, fantastic. And I think you won this category last year, did you not, Kim Taylor? Yes. So Indeed, uh, between. are you feeling very excited now and can take the rest of the day off because of your brilliance? <laughs> it's a fantastic day, as you say. <laughs> and uh, we really want to thank everyone again who considers Mila to be the most reliable premium brand. It's excellent to be able to say that uh, because quality and reliability ability have always been our priorities. That's why we are the only household appliance manufacturer to test our appliances extensively for a 20 years use. Ah, Did you okay. know that we test every appliance at our factory gates? For us, longevity is the ultimate durability. What we say is buy better and buy less. Okay. This award shows that the public recognizes our efforts to provide top quality products. A big thank you to you all again. Very, very well done. Thank you very much. No, I didn't. You said, did you know that? I did not know that, but now I do to know about for, for liability for two decades and the testing that you also do. It might not be as much as Michele and Raquel do, but <laughs> maybe it is. But in any event, brilliant. Congratulations. That is definitely coming your way. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so I will hand that over. Uh, so I didn't ask you, yes, Raquel, for you, why mm -hmm. this winner? I didn't, uh, didn't ask that. Well, we had incredible results from uh, the consumers uh, that have been uh, surveyed. Uh, over uh, 6,000 uh, products uh, of uh, especially washing machine from Miele were uh, purchased and we collected the experience of consumers on that. And uh, the result was they were uh, a winner. Fantastic. And clearly, so clearly doing a brilliant job. So that one can join join its fellows there. Uh, where are we? Where are we actually at the last subcategory? We are. We are. We are. So that last subcategory, can we find out, please, under reliability, what it is?
So the small ones, Rakele, what are we looking at here? What are we testing here? We are testing uh, especially, uh, I have to say, products uh, to keep uh, the house uh, on order, especially vacuums. And okay. uh, we decided uh, to assess, uh, to attribute a new category this year, uh, because the, um, these products were very, very requested, their market has increased, and probably also due to the COVID experience, yep. uh, everybody is uh, paying more and more attention to this kind of small uh, electrodomestic. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Okay, so uh, again, a reminder of the nominees, and let's reveal the winner. Fantastic. Look, a little bit of there, a little bit of there, a little bit of dancing. AEG, a very, very warm congratulations. Let me ask Rakele, you know, why this winner? And let me tell you, I know a thing or two about um, aspirator. <laughs> what do we call it? Vacuum cleaners, because I have a border collie now since lockdown. And I've gone through a few and I should have come to this winning brand so why this winner i also got a dog uh, okay. during the covid time so yes uh, what can i say they especially uh, have been found uh, really satisfying for our consumers and uh, in the after purchase experience especially for canisters okay. so traditional vacuums yes. and uh, we are very happy to to announce that the winner is ag Fantastic. So I think I can ask to join us uh, again, the Director of Corporate Communications, Sales and Services Europe, Electrolux Business Area Europe, Maximilian Müller, who has 20 million hats to join us. Well, congratulations to you. I swear to God, I'm so peeved. I've gone through three of your competitors' brands. I should have just come to you. How does it feel? Well, it's amazing. And uh, as you say, it's a very strong competition. And uh, so really, really great. Uh, to to make the race. Um, thank you very much, uh, Euro Consumer, for for this uh, second important award today. Product reliability and user experience, as we all know, are key in building and securing consumer confidence. At AG, we are proud to have shown the world for more than 40 years now that choosing premium quality is also a choice for more sustainable living. Our ent entire AG product lineup reflects what we stand for as a brand. We are relentlessly responsible without compromising on innovation. That's our mantra. We are driving sustainability by technical innovation, built to last quality and resource efficient solutions. And consumers are increasingly choosing brands with a purpose yep. that they feel matches their own values, which makes AG the perfect fit. Once again, a big thank you on behalf of the full AG team for this great recognition. And we promise we will continue to be a reliable partner in the homes of our consumers, making sure we are back here on stage also next year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Indeed. There you go. You've thrown down the gauntlet for everybody else. Well, huge congratulations again. Thank you very much. And, and thanks also for being able to be with us uh, because it's so lovely to speak to the winner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. And I can hand that one to you now. Last. Uh, so all of the trophies are going to be dispatched at top speed. Um, before I close, uh, not just these lovely uh, awards, but also this, um, uh, but also this event as a whole. Sorry, I thought somebody was whispering in my ear there, saying, "Cat, there's another subcategory." I had one of those strange <laughs> moderating moments there, thinking, "Oh my God, really?" No. I am correct. Before I close these lovely awards and, of course, the event as a whole, I have to turn to these lovely people at my sides, Michele Rakele. So very much your baby, this, so very much. You put in so much hard work. Uh, you know, you've, uh, uh, you know, been on beaches, uh, on sun lounges, and you've been testing things and reading consumer surveys and consumer responses. So a few last words. Uh, from you, Michele, yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. So we make some joke uh, to make more animated this sort of carousel, but uh, consumers are living a very difficult uh, time. Eh? So inflation is rising, uh, and we as consumer organization, 
we will do a big effort in supporting the consumer, in advising the consumer in, in choosing the best product, the best services, in facilitating the consumer in, a, in um, accessing to good uh, offer and best deal in the market. But uh, I think that is, a, let me say, something that we cannot do uh, alone. So also, as we saw today, the manufacturer have are playing a fundamental role mm -hmm. and um, is a time of, uh, let me say, thinking to the, to the inflation. It's also a time of responsibility for all yes. the players. I'm thinking also to the provider, energy provider. We talked about supermarket provider. I mean, all the market is under pressure, but uh, that is the moment to, that each player in the market has to do the best for uh, supporting the consumer in their daily life uh, and in managing their budget. So mm -hmm. that will be, let me say, uh, the moment where uh, we, we have to show that we can collaborate and cooperate for the best of our society. Thank you, and thank you very much. And, and you should, uh, I think, bring to the fore those sobering words, because you are exactly right. We are living a very, very difficult time. And I think that trust, increasing consumers' trust, and increasing the information and the transpar yeah. transparency, which is a critical part of enhancing that trust, is, is what you know your organizations, these fabulous uh, national organizations, are doing. And uh, now more than ever, critical yeah. critical work thank you very much also very much your baby uh, yes, last yeah. last words from you well uh, first of all i want to thank you all uh, my colleagues who have been working on all this data as you said before all this data were analyzed and it was a great effort and also i want uh, to point out uh, the passion that i saw not only from our side but also from the side of uh, uh, the brands today because uh, i really think uh, it's a um, it's a common objective uh, to satisfy consumers uh, and to provide uh, the right ways uh, to satisfy them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as we heard from, you know, uh, some of those uh, winners there also, um, the consumer is wiser and wiser and wiser um, and getting more demanding and as it should be, knows what is needed and not least in this very, very critical time when value for money yeah. has to has to be right at the top there so um huge thanks to both of you thank you so much for thank being you. with me it's thank so you, delightful Katrina. and of course um huge thanks um to uh both both of them but also for those fabulous teams across that whole network that we heard of all of those organizations for their really rigorous and meticulous work um let me also because that's my job at the end of an event say thanks uh to a few other uh organizations and people without whom all of this could not be possible. Of course, the five national consumer organizations that were mentioned by Michele uh, right at the start, Altro Consumo, Testa Sha, which is where we are, Ocu Deco Proteste and Proteste. So thank you and a claps to all of you. I hope that many of you from those organizations did have the chance to tune in. Let me, of course, extend warm thanks to the organizers, Euro Consumers, to the wonderful speakers. OK, they've been and gone, but apart from my lovely presenters here, the wonderful speakers. Can I also thank the technical team from Blue Moon? They've been keeping things rolling along nicely here at Test Asha, the lights on and uh, everything rolling. And thanks, of course, to Test Asha uh, for lending us this studio in their premises in Brussels. And who do I thank last but not least? Of course, you for turning up and for tuning in. There really is no point in doing this without you on the other side of the camera. Uh, we couldn't see you. I kind of felt you were with us. I really do hope that you felt that you were with us here in Brussels too. Uh, on that note, can I say it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege uh, to steer us through the event as I said right at the outset, seriously, as a consumer, I do not need to be convinced of the value of the work of these brilliant organizations. It is critical, and I guess they've got our collective backs. And next time I'll wear a tie, just because <laughs> that was so brilliant. And so, uh, Michele, Raquel and I, we sign off from Brussels, and we wish all of you, of course, a very good rest of the day. See you, hopefully, next year. <laughs>